Yeah. All right, everybody, everybody, just give us a minute here. We're getting some of the monitors turned on. Oh, that didn't take long at all. Okay, that was fast. Okay. You ready? All right. Good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to the Wednesday, January 12th annual meeting for the Board of Directors for PPACG. And for those of you that uh, many, most of you probably know this, but we will have two meetings today. We'll have the annual meeting starting off. Uh, and then after that, we'll go to the regular meeting. So uh, the, the annual meeting will be called to order, uh, adjourned, and then we'll go to the next meeting. All right, so uh, this is a call to order. And if I could ask uh, Andy, as always, to establish a quorum for us. Sure. Um, Happy New Year. Good morning, everybody. Um, I think we have a quorum in the room, which is great. And I'll try to make sure I identify everybody that's online as well. But I'll, starting in the room, uh, Chair Vanderwerf, uh, Mayor Thompson, City of Fountain, uh, Trustee Havenar, uh, Town of Palmer Lake, uh, Commissioner Eric Stone, Teller County, Council Member Dave Donaldson, City of Colorado Springs, Council Member Robert Zuluaga, Woodland Park, uh, Trustee uh, Mayor Pro Tem, Roland Gardeen, uh, Town of Calhan. Uh, Commissioner Dick Elsner, Park County, Commissioner Holly Williams, El Paso County, and Mayor Don Wilson, Town of Monument. So pretty fulsome, I wasn't counting, but a good uh, turnout here in person in the room. One line, I see uh, Mayor John Graham, Manatee Springs, Council Member Yolanda Avila, Colorado Springs. Uh, I believe I saw Commissioner Cami Bremer. Any other board members online? I see uh, Nancy Hengem. Oh, I'm sorry, Council Member Hengem. Okay, good morning, everybody. Um, yes, we definitely have a quorum. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, let's go ahead and proceed then uh, to our action items. And the first uh, order of business today is 2A, which is election of officers for the PPACG uh, Board of Directors. Now, if you go to your packet, you'll see that we do have a slate there. Uh, but as always, uh, there, uh, and including in this meeting, there are opportunities if anybody wishes to nominate from the floor. So let me open up the floor and just see if there are any additional nominations. All right, hearing none, uh, uh, is there any conversation, discussion, or questions with regard to the slate? All right, and hearing none with that comment, I'll entertain a motion. Commission. Commissioner Williams, I move we approve this slate for officers. Second. second, Eric Stone, Teller County. All right, very good. That's been moved and seconded. Uh, let's go ahead and proceed with the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 And are there any opposed? Okay, hearing none, our first order of business is completed and uh, thank you everybody. Uh, and I'll just, uh, for myself, I appreciate uh, your trust in uh, these officers uh, for continuing for 2022. Thank you so much. Let's continue now to item 2B, the appointment of board members. And it looks like we have in order here, the first one is transit representative. Go ahead. Right. The, the board has historically appointed either somebody from the city of Colorado Springs or the city of Fountain to serve as our primary transit rep in the past. Okay, and it's alternated back and forth just by board practice um, from the one jurisdiction to the other as the primary lead in 2021. It was council member Yolanda Avila as a lead transit rep on behalf of the board. Um, so sticking with the practice uh, this year would flip back over to the city of Fountain, um, which is uh, standard practice. So, I so I'd, I'd like to continue to be the, um, the secondary, uh, this is Yolanda Avila for the transit rep. And just to make sure I understood that, uh, uh, Councilwoman Avila, you said uh, to be the second for this position? The secondary. Uh, uh, okay, the alternate. Sharon would be the, no, it's not an alternate, but um, Sharon would be the rep. And I, I don't know if it's the alternate. Can you clarify, Andy? Because we meet uh, together. Yeah. Alternate backup. Uh, we haven't been real specific and consistent. We just had to have something in the primary role, so you have primary and secondary, yeah. primary, alternate, whichever way. I and mean, yeah, we work together. Mm -hmm. That's uh, great. It's just, you have to be a transit provider to have that seat. So, right. so okay. if anybody else ever became a transit provider, then we would have a third person in the, in the, in the queue. Thank yeah. you very good. Thank you very much. And uh, Councilwoman Avila, thank you for your continued interest in that. 
Um, and I don't know if we vote on the second or not, but we're certainly going to vote for the transit rep. But I, whether we vote or not, I'm perfectly comfortable with uh, Yolanda being uh, the backup in case uh, uh, Mayor Thompson cannot participate in whatever meeting might take place. I move so. we approve Sharon Thompson to be the primary representative to the transit and um, Yolanda Avila to be the backup, the secondary. Second, second Eric Stone, Teller County. Okay, there is a motion and a second. I think there were two seconds that happened at the same time. Was it Mr. Graham was the other one as well? The mayor can have it. Yes, it was. I, right. I, certainly the other uh, the gentleman uh, is, is welcome to do this. You're, you're both being gentlemen and you're offering the other to make a motion that I guess I've got to choose. Uh, uh, maybe we could um, have uh, Mr. Graham uh, make the second this time because I think Mr. Stone made the second on the previous meeting. That's just about spreading it around a little bit, I guess, as a choice. Right. So, I'll make the second. John Graham, man, at two springs. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, is there any, are there any questions or, or any conversation the board needs to have about this motion and second? All right. Hearing none, uh, uh, let's go ahead and proceed with the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Are there any opposed? All right. Hearing none. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mayor Thompson, for uh, stepping up for that. Um, and uh, we look forward to hearing good things from that activity. Let us move now to 2B2, which is uh, the Statewide Transportation Advisory Committee. And in your packet, we do have uh, the list of those that are presently in those positions. Is there any, are there any questions or is there any uh, comments anybody on the board wishes to make at this point? Where do, however many alternates we have, because on this particular board, we can have as many alternates as we want, because that way it just gets you in the queue of getting the agenda and seeing what's going on with this deck. I, I would like to be last. I, I'm not going to go up to Denver to the meeting. I just would like to read the notes, pop in if I want mm -hmm. to, and, and give my thoughts to, to uh, Commissioner ha uh, Williams if if needed and mr chair yes please i would also like to be included okay that's two mm -hmm. and i think i saw a raised hand from mr stone or or maybe it was uh, mr stone you, i think your hand was raised and then mr donaldson uh I, I was just going to uh there can be more discussion on those who want to be included but uh i just think that commissioner williams has done an exemplary job both in uh you know her knowledge of uh uh, you know, transportation issues of the area and her ability to to communicate those up with the stack committee. And I would nominate her to continue as our stack representative. And then uh, uh, I would be more than happy to continue on as the first alternate if that would be the pleasure of the board. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, yes, uh, Mr. Donaldson. Um, and Mr. Chair, I'd like to uh, second the nomination of uh, uh, Commissioner Williams and then also ask to be added as an alternate. Okay, very good. Thank you very much. We have a motion and a second for our primary, and uh, uh, we can continue on discussion with that, but let's see who else is interested in uh, being an alternate. And uh, Andy, if you might be uh, writing the names down so we can uh, continue to uh, have that list. Are there any other volunteers? And we have some hands up. Okay, thank you very much. I appreciate pointing that out. Um, I think um, Councilwoman Hengem has her hand up, so please go yeah. ahead. Yeah, I would also just like to be on the list to receive the notes and stay uh, connected and totally support the motion. Outstanding. Thank you very much. And I see uh, Mr. Douglas has his hand up. Uh, um, um, please, go, go ahead. Yeah, I, I would like to be an alternate as well, please. Ray Douglas from Park County. And or Mr. Do I, or do I need to be a member of the board? Well, Ray, uh, this is Dick Elsner. Mm -hmm. um, I think in that uh, we really don't have anything to do with the, the uh, MPO down here, okay. that uh, we will add you as an alternate from the Central Front Range. Sure. Thank you. Excellent. I appreciate uh, your interest in volunteering, Mr. Douglas, and looks like uh, there'll be a good place for you that will allow you to participate in those meetings. Thank you. Okay, I think uh, uh, Councilwoman Avila, you have your hand up. Yes, I, I'd like to be an alternate just to get the uh, information as well. Okay, very good. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. If the staff could just help us out 
to make sure we're not missing anybody online. Actually, now that you've spread that screen out, it's easy to see, I think, everybody. I don't see any other hands up uh, online. Are there any other volunteers either online or in the board room at this point? All right. So um, we have Holly Williams, primary, Eric Stone, first alternate. Um, I'm moving down from second alternate, so I don't know if we if we just want to move Wayne up or if somebody else wants to step into third alternate. Uh, Councilmember Williams isn't here to defend himself. I think he was appointed last year when he was actually still a member of the PPACG board, but you don't okay. necessarily have to be a member of the board to be a stack representative, not right. to get into the weeds there. Yeah, I was just trying to get him in the right order, so. I'd probably go with board members first. Don't tell Wayne I said that. Okay. <laughs> well, the order I wrote them down, you know, which the order they volunteered in. So I guess we just put them in that order if nobody's, I'm not trying to take over what you're doing. No, no, please. I'm glad you're I, doing you it. You went writing them down. So, yeah. Um, so we had, um, obviously, Holly is um, the primary, first alternate, Eric Stone, then Dave Donaldson is who I have next down, Nancy Hingen, and Yolanda Avila, just kind of the order. And then, um, and then John. Wayne. John and Andrew, John Gunning, Andy Gunning, and then myself. Does that work? Yes, uh, Mr. Stone. Yeah, just as a, a point of order, Mr. Chairman, uh, my motion was to was right. to nominate specifically for uh, the uh, representative only. Uh, it, the motion need to be amended uh, for first alternate. I appreciate that, and actually, we probably should proceed with the vote on the uh, primary. And uh, then we can continue the conversation with the alternates. So if there's no objection to that approach because that's what it, the motion is on the floor. Why don't we go ahead and proceed with that? Okay. So on the, on the motion made by uh, Mr. Stone, uh, let us go ahead and proceed with the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 And are there any opposed? All right, that passes and congratulations, Holly. All right, let's continue the conversation then with the alternates. And, um, and let's see, I, I, I see myself on the list and uh, I was happy to be an alternate. I never needed to go up to Denver. And it, I'm, I'm happy to remain on the list, but uh, I'm also happy to be at the bottom of that list just in case something happens and we have a bunch of people that can't make it uh, to do my best to try to make it to the meeting to make sure we have representation. So I'm happy to stay on the list, but on the bottom with some others that wish to so, be at the bottom. Yeah, I just wonder if I could make a suggestion. So uh, please, um, if we could have Eric Stone be the first alternate because he's backed me up really good and maybe have John Leosados be the second because he's also there to poke me in the shoulder when I need to, uh, uh, when I miss something. <laughs> he's my support. Um, and then maybe we just forward out the rest of the agenda to everybody else. Well, I think we have a few others. Receive that, the official stack notices. So the alternates would be our representatives to go to the meetings. And, you know, I don't think there's a problem with everybody getting the notes, but I think okay. we need officially designated alternates, whether right. we do that or not. And um, a couple of years ago, we did have to go down to the third person third or fourth person because of vacations and different things, so. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So um, there's a recommendation for Eric Stone as first alternate, John Leo Satos as second alternate. Okay. Um, and then, okay. Go ahead and continue with the rest of the names. Okay, so if if Commissioner Stone was number one and then John Leo Satos was two, um, just like I said, putting him in the order, Dave Donaldson would now be three, uh, Nancy Hengen would be four, uh, Yolanda would be five. Uh, Andy Gunning would be six. Could I suggest Councilmember Zulawaga expressed interest, oh. slot him in above me and somewhere <laughs> in, in that range? <laughs> okay. Okay. So that would be um, okay. Five, Yolanda. Six, Mr. Zulaga. Seven, Andy Gunning. I'd put eight Wayne Williams. Oh, I have okay. Eight Wayne Williams, nine Stan Vanderwerth, and I'm number ten. Do I, you know, make no two more, make it a dozen? I think uh, <laughs> also Councilmember uh, Donaldson also said that. Oh, I'm sorry. I, 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 thought, I, I thought I read him as. I three. thought he was reading right as three. Did you read it? She, she, yeah, three. I'm in there. I'll That's go back okay. to sleep now. I'm sorry. No, it's okay. <laughs> I can go through it again, but. 
Okay. Uh, hey, the great news is we're increasing the alternates. That means there's a lot of interest. And, yeah. uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, no matter where you stand on that stack, you're, I believe you're always welcome to participate in those yes. meetings to go up there and, and be yeah. personally be a part of it. So just keep that in mind. Uh, and that gives you the opportunity if you see something in that meeting that maybe that, that our primary may be missing, or if there's some nuance to it, you can have that conversation with our primary uh, 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 Commissioner Williams and make sure that uh, we've got those inputs as we go forward and try to do what's right for our community up there at that meeting. Yeah, yeah so Commissioner I, was, Williams. I, I appreciate the full slate of people. Uh, just be aware, okay, there is a stack meeting on Friday, so I will send that and we'll get that out. Um, probably for the next two or three months, we're going to have to be doing, uh, the governor will still require us to do Zoom. So they're easy meetings to attend. And then uh, maybe, gosh, maybe in June, we all should show up and just scare them to death. <laughs> just teasing. Okay. I, I think that uh, we should vote on whether that's, that's an idea. official <laughs> policy or not. I kind of like that approach. <laughs> Mr. Elson. It would be fun. <clears throat> yeah. and. Um... I'm the uh, representative to stack from the Central Front Range. So if you can't get a hold of Holly and, and want to poke me, uh, Central Front Range covers uh, rural El Paso County and Teller and Park Counties. And of course, um, being a member of PPACG, uh, Colorado Springs is a very important part of that too. So, <laughs> And that includes Calhan. <laughs> So that would include Roland, and um, it also, um, I will let Commissioner Geithner know too. Yeah. We, we deeply appreciate one of our rural commissioners acknowledging the importance of the Front Range. <laughs> <laughs> well, when I start asking favors, you'll know why. <laughs> hey, we're still working on the gondola idea over here. So. All right, so let me, uh, let me review the bidding, and, and uh, I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll make this uh, formal and go through a vote. Uh, but we have uh, Eric Stone at number one, John Leosados, number two, Dave Donaldson, number three, Nancy Hengem, number four, Yolanda Avila, number five, uh, Robert Zulaga, number six, uh, Andy Gunning, number Thanks. seven, Wayne Williams, number eight, myself, number nine, and Sharon Thompson, number 10. <clears throat> Are there any, uh, is there any conversation or interest in uh, either adding names or moving names around, or are we good to go? Any, any, let, let me just ask if there's any further comments at this point. Yes, sir. Uh, I, I just found out about the RT8 uh, volunteering system. So uh, I'd like to be part of it. All right, let's add you to the list. Am I on to you or what? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I, you would be Central yeah. Front Range. Okay. So well, send me a note and um, we can add you to the Central okay. Front Range right. alternate. Thank list. you. You know, I like it though. See, we're adding members to two uh, representatives, power and numbers, I think. So, all right, very good. Uh, are there any then any additional comments or questions with regard to that list? All right, hearing none, let's go ahead and proceed with the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 And are there any opposed? All right, none opposed. We're increasing the numbers, increasing our influence. I appreciate everybody's uh, willingness to volunteer and that's a great list. So thank you, everybody. Let's move on to item number three or Mr. two. Chair, yes, one simple please. question for Holly before we move to the next point. Please go ahead. You said the next meeting's is Friday. That's tomorrow, uh, this week. And what time, please? So the meeting is on Friday at 9 a.m. via Zoom. And I will ask um, John to send out the details or Andy to everybody on the committee. So thanks. And yes, um, you're welcome. Yeah. They're, they're typically the second Friday of each month from 9 to 12, roughly. Yeah. Typically. I think, is that one going to start at 8.30 now? I think it starts at 8.30 now. Oh. Okay. Yeah, we'll have to check that. So, very good. Okay, nine o'clock Friday. Okay. <laughs> All right, let's uh, proceed now with item two uh, B three, the Front Range Passenger Rail Commission. And there's a little discussion here, Andy, on this one as well. A little bit of discussion, and I'm going to ask John to come up to help clarify, so I don't butcher this one. We actually don't need to make a specific appointment today. We've got a little bit of time because of overlapping or 
new commissions that'll start later in the spring as the existing Southwest Chief Front Range Passenger Rail Commission winds down in March-ish, I believe. But John? Uh, 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 thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, members of the, uh, uh, the board. So the Southwest Chief Front Range Passenger Rail Commission, of which Jill Gabler is our current representative, is winding down their business and shall probably cease existence and sunset in uh, uh, March or April of this year. Once that goes away, then the Front Range, Pas the Front Range Passenger Rail District um, will uh, come into being. And that's sort of a different animal. The Southwest chief part of the operations will mainly fall under CDOT because it's in a much better place now. And then this will focus on the, uh, the district itself. As far as uh, what uh, Mr. Gunning is talking about, um, or at least from, maybe I'm overstepping, but our staff recommendation is uh, continue to have a Jill Gabler who's on the the call here so she can correct me if I got any of this wrong, uh, to continue to be the Southwest uh, Chief Front Range Passenger Rail representative so she can ride, ride that ship all the way up to the end. Um, yeah. <laughs> and then, then we can uh, appoint the new Front Range Passenger Rail District. This region receives two uh, uh, representatives. One is appointed by the city of Colorado Springs. One would be uh, from Bike Speak Area Council of Governments. Um, as far as making our recommendation, I believe the legislation says we have to do it by April. So you can do it today and then just know that that person wouldn't actually be seated uh, and sworn in until there's a, a thing that actually exists to do it, which will probably be in June. So you could do that today or you could kind of take a step back and have a couple of months to consider who you want to do. We just want to make sure if you're prepared to do it today, you can. But if you want to take a couple of months, you've got that as well. Happy to answer any questions or deflect them over to uh, Ms. Gabler. Yes, Mr. Stone. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, that just wanted to put forward my name. I would be very interested in serving in that capacity uh, on the uh, the Passenger Rail Commission. The so, Front Range Passenger Rail? The Front Range Passenger Rail Commission. So okay. I'll throw that out there. The no, for the, the commission goes. one that starts in April. The one that starts in yeah, April. The yeah, the district. Okay. okay, very good. Thank you. Um, so we do have a, a volunteer for that. So also any additional comments? Um, we do have a couple of things to uh, address here. Uh, you know, and we have a couple of options. Uh, maybe we'll start first with the um, uh, Southwest Chief and Front Range Passenger Rail. We have uh, uh, Jill Gabler in that position right now. And as you said, uh, that will continue to run, I guess, till around March. And we, we can um, make the recommendation to leave uh, Jill Gabler in that position, let her continue until that uh, 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 concludes. Or uh, we also have the option to vote on and appoint someone else. And yes, go ahead. I would just like to make the suggestion that we uh, say commission. And then when we discuss the next office, we say district rather than, I think it's very confusing to just say front range rail. So um, I, believe, I believe if I understand right, you're wanting to discuss the commission. Yes, that is correct. Okay. Just the commission only right. at this point. Not, not that they didn't have enough adjectives in all these descriptions. <laughs> and I was trying to discriminate between the two by saying uh, Southwest Chief and Front Range Rail, but we can use uh, commission and district. It's okay. okay. Um, Mr. Elsner. I would, I would move that we keep Jill where she is until it goes away. For, and uh, um, to satisfy the mayor's that. interest, to put the word commission in your motion. <laughs> okay, commission. <laughs> Thank you. I, I think Jill would make an excellent continued commissioner. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. And I believe, is that a second? That is a second. Okay, yes. very good. So we have a, a motion and a second. And uh, I'll make the point. Um, she's been on that board. She knows the people on the board. She knows what they've been doing. It seems to make sense to me for uh, uh, the motion and the second to, to, to continue with that. Mr. Zulaga. Uh, she has her hand up online. Oh, very good. All right. I'm so sorry. I missed that. And uh, Jill, did you have your hand up? You'd like to say a thing or two? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I, I'm sorry. I didn't use the official Zoom hand. I physically raised my hand. Um, <laughs> but it's hard in this, this, this way to do this. I, I apologize. I just wanted to uh, thank the motioner and the seconder for the 
the, the privilege to, to vote um, for me today and that I would be very happy to, to finish out my term on the commission and uh, um, as we put this uh, commission to bed and start the district in the, in the middle of the year. And it has been an honor serving PPACG in this role. And um, I just really just wanted to thank you all of you. So, and I look, I look forward to seeing who the, uh, the board will bring forward. Hopefully you will uh, choose somebody who cares a lot about passenger rail and wants to ensure we have reliable and safe transportation along our front range. So thank you again. And I wish all of you a happy new year. Uh, thank you very much. And since that is a commission, I guess we can say Commissioner Gabler, right? So thank you, Commissioner Gabler. And uh, we do appreciate your service to that board on behalf of uh, PPACG. Are there any comments or questions with regard to this specific topic? And then we'll get to the second topic in just a minute. All right, hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed. All right, that passes. Congratulations, Commissioner Gabler. Uh, and uh, you'll, you'll serve until I guess that board closes and I, I guess the scheduled plan is March. Um, I believe so, but again, it, it, things can change with in, in today's world, but we believe that they're finishing out their final report um, and then they should conclude business in, in March or April um, with, with the conclusion of the final um, uh, Front Range Passenger Rail uh, report that concludes their business there. And then the Southwest Chief, um, I believe, then moves over to uh, CDOT Division of Transit and Rail. And then any remaining funds that have not yet to be expended, um, I believe it was in the legislation, then when it sunsets, then moves over to the new district as seed money, I believe. Great. I could be wrong. Thank you very much. <clears throat> All right, let's, uh, let's move on to the second topic. Oh, um, is there someone that has a comment? Just a question. Yes, Mayor, go ahead. The, um, the agenda is for the Front Range Rail Commission, which we just did. Um, the agenda is not for the Front Range Passenger District appointment or nomination. Um, do we have to do that at the next meeting as a separate item? Well, that actually is the first order of business for this topic is whether we wish to defer this vote or proceed. Um, you know, there are some advantages to having the person in place because they can start getting ready, but that doesn't mean that would necessarily be the sentiment of the board. I, I'm okay with going forward. I just want to clarify what it what was advertised on the agenda since we are kind of adopting our CORA. And Sunshine it, it's, a, today. it's a good point. It's a good question. In reading the memo, I think we make a little more, we do clarify a little bit further about the different appointments for the different commissions and districts. Um, so even though that doesn't, what's in the memo doesn't totally align with how it's spelled out on the agenda. I think that's fine. Okay. Um, but I do have a suggestion on that note. I was also thinking too, and I was trying to telepathically communicate with John. I don't know, I've, I've got to do a little bit of research. I get, we have to make sure, I think, as PPACG makes its appointment to the district, does it need to be somebody within the district confines? And I don't have the definition of what it is in front of me, but my understanding was it was just within our region, it was El Paso County. And I think it includes the MPO. So Woodland Park, where I live, uh, is included as part of the road of the Front Range Rail District. Okay, the taxing district might be different. I, I appreciate that. And I think that's you're fine there. But I don't know if you have anything else you need to add. But my understanding from the legislation that passed last year, as far as who would be taxed within that district, and I don't know if that makes a difference as far as who our rep is, but the taxing area was just within El Paso County portion of, of the MPO, I think. But it may be wrong. I don't, I don't think, I don't think that's wait. accurate. I, I do believe Teller County was, uh, the Willow Park area was included as part of the taxing district. Excuse okay. me, this is this is Jill, I'm sorry. I am, um, and as the person serving on the commission, um, I can let you know that no, Teller County is not in the district and is not um, um, a, a person that you can appoint to the commission. I'm sorry, I didn't realize Mr. Stone was outside of El Paso County, but no, it can't be someone in Teller County. And if you guys are questioning that today, my recommendation would be for you to delay until you can um, make that certain. But um, I was part of the, the group that got the bill passed and, and that. <clears throat> It, the district does not include Teller. <clears throat> and this is Commissioner Williams. I'm trying to pull up the bill so we can see, but <laughs> so. I, I would suggest we defer until we clarify that since he is interested. And if he's really interested in it, I'd like to. 
see them have the chance for that seat. Yeah, and and if if Teller County is not part of the taxing district, then absolutely I would 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 not have interest in in serving because it needs to be to come from representation from within the taxing district. So I don't I don't have any any <coughs> argument with that whatsoever. But my understanding was because it was the MPO, which includes Woodland Park. Is that that would be part of the taxing district, but we can certainly delay until uh, uh, we get more detailed information on that. And Mr. Donaldson. Oh, I, I was simply going to say if that is a um, motion by the vice chair, I'll second that to delay it. <clears throat> well, I, <clears throat> I don't know that we need a vote to delay, but uh, since we have a motion and a second, we can go ahead and vote on it. And, uh, <laughs> it's it's there's no harm. There's no harm. That's right. We're allowed to vote. There's no harm in that. So, um, but what I'll do is uh, let me just uh, open up the floor and see if there's any additional comments. And obviously, this uh, uh, this motion and second uh, would then engender a need for the staff to do that research and find out which members of our board are in fact eligible to hold the position. Okay. Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Zulaga. Well, my suggestion would be maybe have a discussion of if there's anyone else who's interested uh, who may also be in the district so that they can be weighing it up or we could be thinking about it between now and the time it's deferred. I think that is an excellent point. I, I also think Colorado Springs already has a seat on the board. So let's think about that a little bit too. Um, and That's right. This is the PPACG yeah. rep. Yes. So um, who, if, I, if I could ask, who is the seat that Colorado Springs now has? We got to use our mic so people online can hear. I'm sorry. For the district, there is no representative. We're just, it's being formed. The, Jill is the person on the commission. So but there the, will be a seat. There right? will be a seat on the district board from PPACG. Yeah. There'll be one from PPACG, if I heard right, one from PPACG and one yeah, from the from city Colorado of Colorado Springs. Springs. Right. And we're not necessarily uh, tuned into the nuance of uh, city council if they've uh, chosen somebody for that position yet or not, but it might be that you haven't yet because we the district haven't. isn't even officially formed yet. Yeah, I don't know if it'll even come if that position will be filled by someone from from uh, city council. Uh, Jill has a comment, but it is also a mayor. I'm so sorry. Oh, there's also other people that have their <laughs> yeah. hands up too. Well, well, well Jill, we've got Jill several hands up this. on. Well, I just want to we'll answer the question that's on the Let's table see. right now, and yes, the please. mayor will be appointing me um, to the the position for Colorado Springs on the board. So I'm just gonna move over to the city to, be the, to become the city's representative. Okay, thank you. All right. And I see a couple of other hands up, uh, Mr. Graham. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I would be uh, interested in, in uh, serving in this capacity, uh, possibly I'd like to learn a little bit more about it. And since uh, it appears that there's gonna be some research uh, to see if uh, Mr. Stone would be uh, permitted to, to hold it. I, I would prefer to defer, but I would like to say that, that I'd be interested in, in uh, like to see what, uh, how, how things play out a little bit, but I, I will throw my hat in the ring to that extent. Uh, thank you. So we have uh, two potential volunteers and then uh, eligibility for those volunteers, of course, is based on the research that we'll do and we'll have a vote in the future. I see that um, Councilwoman Avila has also got her hand up. Uh, yes, I do. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm. I hope that we don't exclude it, just because I'm from the city. But I am really interested in that, and um, would like to see uh, that succeed uh, in the front uh, in, in the passenger rail. So I'm. In, I just want to let you know that I'm interested, and I don't know if it should be a disqualifier just because I am part of the city as well. I am on PPACG, so I, I want to make sure that I'm not disqualified because there's the city rep. Thank you. I appreciate that. And, uh, you know, my sense of it is, is that um, whoever is within the appropriate district, if they're a member of this board, uh, they would be eligible. But that doesn't mean that this board can't have a conversation about making sure that we have, uh, you know, as broad as possible representation on the, on, on the commission. But I would say that uh, Councilwoman Avila is eligible. So uh, maybe we could just add the name. And I also know that uh, uh, Councilwoman Hengem also has her hand up. Please go ahead. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, actually, all I was really gonna say is I think it's probably, I've heard a few people talk about learning more about the commission. I think it would be helpful. And I don't know if, uh, if Commissioner 
Gabler has anything else to offer regarding the work of the commission. I think understanding that and then looking um, at PPACG uh, where we're being really clear about where the district is and, um, you know, just looking at what are the, the types of uh, representation that we really want to have. Um, and my hope would be um, that we select someone else for PPACG who is both interested in um, the front range rail, the passenger rail, the success of it, but also, um, you know, is able to, to look broadly at, at all of the, uh, at all of the issues. So um, just, just asking us to pull back and think about what's best for, for the entire region. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much. And we already have, we already have agreed to defer. Uh, go ahead, uh, uh, Commissioner Williams. Point of order here. Um, this is from the bill, Senate bill um, 238, uh, 21, uh, 2021, 238. The entire, okay, so the areas that comprise it, it's first of all, Broomfield, City, County of Denver. Then it says all areas within Adams, Arapaho, Boulder, Douglas, El Paso, Huerfano, Jefferson, Larimer, Los Animas, Pueblo, and Weld that are located within the area of a metropolitan planning organization. So that would take out the Eastern, like Calhan, the Eastern side of El Paso County. And then um, there's some specifics for Larimer and Weld. And um, the, so that would mean it does need to be someone within El Paso County because Teller's not mentioned at all. So congratulations, you're not getting taxed. <laughs> <laughs> I, for those online, uh, Mr. Stone did give a thumbs up. I think he appreciates not being taxed. So uh, yes, uh, go ahead, John. Uh, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, first, uh, before I get to my comment, my apologies for making the memo um, a little ambiguous. That, that's on me. Uh, but the intent was to say, yes, you, you, you could have done that. So my apologies for, for not to uh, no. be better arrest. Yeah, no, no need to worry about that. Um, but, uh, we're having a robust conversation here, and I think it's excellent because it's helping us to get ready for when we do go to an appointment. And there was a recommendation from um, Councilwoman Hengem to maybe make sure that we have a good understanding about the, the statute and the obligations and responsibilities. I see some other heads uh, shaking yes here in the room. So perhaps we could get that agendized um, and that will allow us to, uh, you know, uh, possibly make a more informed decision about who we would uh, select as our representative. Yeah, and Mr. Chair, I did uh, invite uh, David Singer from CDOT to be at the meeting, but he had a conflict uh, because again, I wanted to make sure that we, actually I anticipated this conversation to some extent and I wanted to have him here to sort of talk about what the, the commission was, or the district rather, I'm, I'm doing it now, the district is doing and that. So we can definitely um, find a, a, a someone from CDOT, either uh, Mr. Singer or perhaps um, Spencer Dodge uh, to be on either the next meeting agenda or the, or the one after that to talk about the district, the work of the district, as well as any uh, nuances on the, represent, the representative um, that is not clear from the, uh, uh, legislation. Great. I think that's an much. excellent idea. I can Thank I you. just clarify. I I was writing down people who had their hands raised. Um, can I clarify if Councilmember Hingen was on the list, or do we? Or I would I'm suggest not. I'm not on the list to be considered for the commission. Okay. I just had a uh, point yeah. to make. That's okay. All. I was just making sure. Okay, and then, great. um, so Andy, are you going to send out a memo, and then people would just put their name to you for the next agenda or something? Is that the way we're going to handle it? Yeah. Well, if I, if I could, uh, we do have some uh, volunteers, but since we have time, I think we need to uh, agendize uh, a presentation. I appreciate, uh, John, that you were uh, anticipating the conversation, was hoping to be able to do that today, but we'll actually, we'll just have to defer to our next meeting. And I think it would be important, even though we do have a list of volunteers, that does not prevent anybody who's eligible from uh, continuing to volunteer as we go forward so that we can 
uh, ultimately select uh, whoever we wish to choose. So there's no limitation on that at this point. We just have a couple names that have expressed interest. Yeah. And can I suggest, Mr. Chair, maybe at the next month's meeting, um, we put out information in advance that explains the both the eligibility and what are the responsibilities of the district? What, what are you going to be doing for the next four years or whatever the length of, of term might be? So that might be helpful for the February discussion and then be ready to make an appointment by March. March was still good with the time frame. I believe so. I think the the legislation had said that we needed to have our our, our uh, representative in place um, uh, by the end of March and into April. So I think we're we're good there. I will also, when I reach out to Mr. Singer from CDOT again, uh, and have it in the memo, there might be some uh, discussion anticipating about alternates. So we will also find out how many alternates were allowed and, and if there's any uh, criteria based on that, because uh, that might be another thing that you'd want to discuss and hopefully. Mm -hmm we can get you the information on that in advance um, instead of at the meeting. Thank you. And uh, as part of your research, I would recommend, and I don't know if they will have this set by our next meeting, or maybe it comes later, but if they have the, uh, the time when they intend on meeting, because just from a practical point of view, for some of us, we have uh, meetings that uh, are dedicated to particular times and that might otherwise not make somebody able to go to this particular meeting. So if there's a way to discover that and figure that out and we can bring that to this meeting, that will also be helpful. And I, Mr. Zulaga, you had your hand raised. Yeah, even though I'm not in the district, um, when you bring CDOT in for discussion, I think it would be valuable if uh, Commissioner Jill, what's your last name? How do you say it? Uh, Gabler. Gabler. It'd be great if she uh, weighs in on just what she's seen in her term there and help us get a perspective of, of where it's moving. Great. I think that's a great suggestion as well, because uh, there'll probably be some, at least some, it, it is a new, it is a new, um, I'm going to try to say the right word. It is a new district and they'll have some different priorities and, and different uh, activities but there is at least some of that is a translatable kinds of uh, information. So, okay. Any other comments or questions? So uh, let's go ahead and uh, plan on trying to have uh, uh, a, a little bit more detail on, uh, you know, the considerations for the board at the next meeting and get that on the agenda. All right, thank you very much. <clears throat> we knew there would be some discussion that took a little longer than I thought, but it's all good. Our next item is uh, 2B4, the Drive Smart Colorado Board. Okay, and John, don't stray away too, too far. If you'll recall, this was uh, the newly comprised or restructured Drive Smart Board as we brought that nonprofit under the PPACG umbrella. We blended board members between the PPACG board and the existing Drive Smart Board. Uh, so the three council member, or the three members that served in 2021 were Council Member Dave Donaldson, Council Member Yolanda Avila, and Mayor Sharon Thompson. Council Member Avila expressed that she needs to step back from that given other resp responsibilities. And I know Commissioner Elsner expressed interest since this is a regional, covers all three counties uh, with this traffic safety initiative that we're trying to really keep the momentum behind. Um, just wanted to throw that out there. I know that had come up in previous discussions. Great, thank you. So we do have one volunteer, Mr. Elsner, go ahead. Yeah. Um... Having met with the, the the director of Drive Smart, um, I really think it's something that uh, the rural areas of PPACG need a rural representative. Uh, we are rapidly becoming uh, some of the most dangerous highways in the state of Colorado between 285 and 24. And um, I think working from that standpoint of how can we make some of our big rural roads uh, safer and uh, get the information out. Um, I would really like to serve on the board. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Mr. Elsner. <clears throat> and we do need to open up the floor to see if there are any other uh, interested members of the board uh, to serve in in uh, in any capacity on any of these three. But before we get to that, uh, Mayor Thompson, you have your hand raised. Yeah, I'd like to continue on the board also, please. Ah, thank you very much. <clears throat> are there any other uh, volunteers? Uh, anybody else that have an interest? Yes, sir. Uh, we just had another death on I-24, I Highway 24. So, and the people in Callahan, we're all starting to get really concerned about the safety of that road. So I'd like to be part of the board. Okay, very good. <clears throat> so we have uh, um, two volunteers this morning. Are there any other volunteers? 
who who was that most recent volunteer? I, I couldn't hear and I didn't hear the name. Uh, I'm Roland Gardine, the Mayor Pro Tem of Callahan. I'm sorry. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Um, and I, I, oh, um, who just spoke up? Oh, please go this, ahead. This is Debbie Swanson. I'm online. I'm a member of the Commission on Aging. Would I be uh, eligible to participate as a potential board member of Drive Smart? Probably not as a board member, but certainly um, come to the meetings. We will include you in the distribution list for sure. And you could be an active member of the um, conversation. Absolutely. But uh, might have to stop short of actually voting for things that the other that the board members vote for. But uh, it, the more the merrier. We'd love to have more involvement. I, I'd like to be participating in that. So shall I send you that information, my, my uh, contact information, or you can get that from Melissa Martz? We can, I see Jody with his hand up. We, we know where you are. We'll, we'll track you down. Thank you, Debbie. Right. Thank you. Super. Appreciate it. All right. Yeah, yes, uh, go ahead. Uh, and, and if I may, again, the, this is a blended board. So the spots that we're talking about now um, with uh, uh, Council Member Donaldson continuing and Mayor Thompson continuing and finding replacement for, for uh, 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 Council Member uh, Avila. Uh, these three spots are specific to the board. That being said, the DriveSmart Colorado board has the top uh, law enforcement officials and other safety folks. So your, your participation in the board is not something that would happen today, uh, but it's not something that is out of the realm of possibility uh, through that other process. And we will get uh, John Henry, who's the president of DriveSmart Colorado, and let him know that you're interested and then that would be a separate process. Just wanted to clarify that because uh, there are folks at large that get on the Drive Smart board through that process. Okay, great. <clears throat> now we have um, <clears throat> two that I believe, um, Mr. Donaldson, I think you have, are, are you interested in continuing to serve on the board? Just haven't um, heard from you. Yeah, I am, but if, and I would, my only concern would be that if Colorado Springs had no representation, perhaps we should have at least one spot but I would be, uh, I would, in a way, I'd be happy to step aside for a mayor pro tem. Raleigh, what's your last name? Guarding. Guarding. Uh, and um, and uh, Mr. Dick Elsner. Uh, so I'll, I'll leave that to others to make a choice between us. Okay. And we have the option. Oh, yes, uh, Mr. Zulaga. I'm not interested in serving on the board, but I would like to be included in the email on it to keep up with the. Um, very good. Thank you very much. Um, so we have a couple of options here. We've got, uh, I think, uh, two that are continue that are serving presently and have expressed interest in continuing. And we have two volunteers. And I guess at this point, um, well, we need to have a conversation about how we're going to proceed with a vote on this. But perhaps, <laughs> perhaps we can ask someone to make a motion and see what the motion might engender. I thought I heard uh, Councilmember Donaldson say he would withdraw his name to serve on the board. Did that, I misunderstand that? Um, I will. My, my only concern would be that Colorado Springs wouldn't have uh, representation, but I, I think Chief Niski, he's, he's part of the board, correct? Correct. And is there any other Colorado Springs representation out of how many members? Good question. Let's go ahead and flip the cards. You've stumped our expert. I, I, I don't have don't the, uh, <laughs> okay. I don't have okay. the, uh, the makeup of the uh, Travis Mark Colorado <laughs> board uh, memorized, unfortunately. Uh, uh, John Henry couldn't be on the call today, so I'm I'm going to have to punt. I apologize. Okay. Can you tell us who we're supposed to have three? Who's the current nominees? So we, we have um, current serving members, Dave Donaldson and Sharon Thompson, uh, who have both expressed an interest in continuing to serve uh, with Mr. Donaldson's willingness to defer if the board sees fit to maybe install the other two volunteers that we have. And um, I, I, I'll just, I think it's, it's a, I think it is appropriate to have somebody from a rural area on this board. I think that makes sense uh, because we do have um, urban representation and we definitely have challenges and issues on our, on our rural roads within the PPACG uh, jurisdiction. Uh, but having said that, I mean, this is, you know, where the board wishes to go. Mr. Donaldson, I see your mic still on. Did you have a further comment? You know, I would just say that 
after thinking this through for a minute, I do think it would make sense to have maybe one rep from the Springs, definitely one from a rural area, and then uh, Fountain also. So I guess I would like to be considered. I'd like to remain. Okay, thank you. So um, uh, at this point, I guess we need to entertain a motion. <laughs> Yes, uh, where, oh, um, okay, uh, Councilwoman Avila, please. Oh, I, I, I was gonna say, I thought we really needed a represent, representative from Colorado Springs and they said he was gonna be in it. So okay, I'm, I'm good. Okay, thank you very much. Are there any other hands raised online? Just making sure. Well, and I was, you were reading my mind. I was thinking it's probably, even if we don't spell it out in the bylaws of Drive Smart, we can maybe amend the bylaws. I, I would really encourage that others that are interested come as well and serve as alternates. And I don't think that makes a big difference between who's an actually, actually a voting member versus an alternate. We're trying to cast a wider net and really do what we can to drive down our serious and fatal crash rates we have across the region. So the more elected officials working alongside with our law enforcement officials around the marketing that we can do in this area, the, the better. So um, I, I think it would be okay yeah. to have some informal alternates part of this as well. Well, I was gonna say, I would love to have an alternate because I think between three people serving on a board, there's probably gonna, the odds are one of us is probably not gonna be able to make it. Right. You know, and um, to have somebody be able to step up and vote, I think that would be, all right. Yes, uh, Mr. Stone. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, I would move uh, to appoint uh, Mayor Sharon Thompson from Fountain, uh, Council Member Dave Donaldson from Colorado Springs, and uh, County Commissioner Dick Elsner from Park County as the primary representative to this board, and then uh, for uh, Mayor Pro Tem Gardine from Calhan uh, to serve as alternate should any of those not be able to attend. I second, Don Wilson. All right, that's been moved and seconded. Let's. Uh, uh, to see if we have any additional comments with regard to that. And uh, Mr. Gardine, uh, do you think that you might find that acceptable? Absolutely. Okay, very good. Thank you very much. All right, so any other comments or questions with regard to that? All right, appreciate the motion and the second. Let's go ahead and proceed with the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Are there any opposed? All right, thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen, for serving. Uh, yes, Mr. Elston. Yeah, I would just like to say that um, we had a long discussion when we were going to take on Drive Smart uh, as to whether we should or not. I'm I'm really appreciative of the fact that everybody is now showing a lot of interest in it, um, and hopefully this board and, and this the organization will do a lot of good work because. We're getting to a point now where um, education is becoming critical because we have a lot of people that I think forgot how to drive or never learned how to drive. And uh, I think Drive Smart is going to become a very vital part of trying to get us back to, to where people understand what yellow lines mean, what white lines mean, and uh, what a stop sign means. Thank you. <laughs> Really, Commissioner Commissioner Elsner, are you going to tell Commissioner Williams that I cannot drive my Kia in those bike lanes downtown? <laughs> <laughs> now, Mr. Elsner was intending on making a comment and then shows uh, it's the better part of valor not to do so. <laughs> All right. For those online, we're, we're, we're having uh, a little fun on a few comments here, but to Mr. Elsner's point, uh, I, I agree with that. I think um, I think this board has made a good choice in picking up Drive Smart, which is about driver safety education. And education is such an important part of what I think public agencies can and should do to, to help uh, our citizens. So I'm, I'm glad that we picked this up. And I'll also um, mention the point that there, real, there, there is a real interest on this board with Drive Smart. So I think we've made a good choice and we'll continue to do that going forward. So thank you everybody for that. And then for those that are not officially um, an appointed member <clears throat> or a voted member or alternate, um, participation in those meetings, I'm sure is still absolutely possible. You can be part of those meetings if you wish to be so, wish to do so. Go ahead. Yes, Mr. Chair, members of the, of the board. Yes, our intent is uh, the, to move those meetings here to PPACG and have them be uh, hybrid. So 
you will have the ability to, to tune in just to kind of listen in on, on what's happening uh, and, and hear the activities. So uh, we will continue to keep you in the loop. Okay, very good. Now um, let's move on because uh, we've concluded with that business item 2B, excuse me, 2C, which is our 2022 Sunshine and CORA compliance. Didn't know if you guys needed me up here. Um, members of the board, Jessica McMullen, your policy and communications manager. Every year, the board of directors is required to designate two things. Um, where the official posting location for PPACG um, meeting notices will be, and who the official person um, as a contact and custodian of the Colorado Opens Records Act um, minutes and information. Um, we are suggesting that the official posting location be the PPACG website with um, directing all staff to post physical copies on the PPACG signboard outside um, for our official posting location. Great, thank you very much. And uh, for, for the board's awareness, uh, just yesterday, uh, we voted on uh, the El Paso County website being the official notice location as well. So this is, uh, this may be obvious to everybody, but everybody does this at the beginning of every year. Uh, just to make sure that we continue to in, to ensure that we have an officially designated place. It's statutory requirement, but it's also just simply the right thing to do. Yes, uh, Mr. Elsner. I'd like to make a motion that we uh, designate the website as the official posting location. Very good. And um, let's see, is there anything else in this particular item that we need to include in that uh, motion? Item two, yeah. Yeah, hang on just a second. Let me make sure. I think there was more. And uh, or well, then Mayor the Thompson. notice on board at uh, 14 South Chestnut Avenue. Um, it looks like we need two two motions: one on the posting, and then one on the Cora. Yeah. Right. Thank you. So uh, you have the. Um, are you making a motion for both? I think we can address both. Together. I was just going to do one at a time, but I could make a motion if you want to cover both. I see. Um, I see no objection. Is there any objection from any other members of the board? Eric Stone, I would second. Okay. So both are included and there is a second. Um, let's go ahead and uh, open up the floor if there's any further comments or questions from any of the board members. Yes, uh, Mayor Thompson. So I'm going to vote no on this and um, it's just kind of like my little pet peeve and I bring it up every year. Um, I believe the official posting place should be a physical location and the, sec the website should be secondary. We're not as large an organization as Colorado Springs or the county that if our website went down or was hacked for some reason, we could have to postpone meetings. Um, so that's just, it's just my thing. Um, so that's all. Very good. We now have a public notice of the intention for one vote no. So uh, Mr. Zulaga. Well, I, I don't know that my... Uh, Opposition is as strong as that, but I agree with you. I do think it needs to be physical posting. And I be, uh, invite a favorable amendment to say that uh, physical posting is required. Because um, I agree, I think that there's an elder generation who's not so um, facile on, on, the, on the computer. And uh, so I support what you're saying. Uh, okay. thank you very thank you very much yeah, um, i'm in my motion then. yes please and say uh approve the designation of ppacg website and the ppacg notice board at 14 south chestnut avenue as the um whatever it is primary the official posting sites i believe we can only have one posting site as our official location um, um, and we can direct staff that they must always to uh, meet it. We, I know Park County designated our website and our bulletin board both as the official site. So you guys have the, law. <laughs> yes, the, uh, go ahead. The recommendation is to do that. Approve the designation of the PPAC website as the official posting location and direct staff to also post physical copies on the PPA CG notice board. So I think both bases are covered just um, by approving it. How about uh, require PPACG staff to post notice? 
Very good. Okay. Um, okay I, th second. I think we have, uh, we had a friendly amendment. Uh, we had the motioner uh, accept that friendly amendment. Uh, the, the seconder also accepted uh, that friendly amendment. So we will have an official posting on the website, but a requirement from the board for PPACG to also do the physical posting at the designated location uh, in the text. Uh, and then we also have, um, well, we were, I think we're intending on uh, covering both together. Yep. So we have uh, just uh, confirming that motion includes the second one and you're asking for approval of that as well. Is that correct? Okay. And for the seconder and uh, the seconder also agrees with that. Okay. Now we, I think we've got uh, a settled motion and second and let's uh, open the floor again if there's any additional comments. Okay. Very good. All right. Hearing none, let's go ahead and proceed with a vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Are there any opposed? All right, excellent. So we have concluded our voting business for our annual meeting agenda. I think there may have been one other motion in there. Are we supposed to designate the policy and communications manager as official custodian of the minutes and the core contact for the Pikes Peak Area Council of Governments? Uh, thank you. I, I guess I was misinterpreting the, 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 the first motion. I thought those were included, but if they're not, uh, let's that, go ahead and proceed. Well, that's where I had the discussion. Can I make a motion that covers both? And you said I could, so I did. Yeah. Oh, so I just voted on that. <laughs> I think we just voted on it. Yeah. I'll say, I will say I again. It's got a little confusing energy. Okay. Okay. All right. uh, if I produce that confusion, my apologies. But, uh, but I think we have concluded our voting on both of those topics and uh, voted uh, uh, aye for both. At this point, um, it's time to adjourn. What I'd like to do before I adjourn is just to say thank you to this board for uh, uh, continuing to do this great work um, and uh, appreciate your trust in the officers that you just uh, elected. We'll, we will endeavor to do everything we can to make sure the PPACG uh, continues to properly serve the public uh, and to grow in our ability to uh, influence you know, uh, uh, people that affect our region one way or another, and also to make sure, because it was some points, specific points made, to ensure that uh, our infrastructure and transportation continues to grow as needed, but also to do it safely. So I thank you everybody for that. Uh, I'll go ahead and adjourn the, this meeting at this point. Can we take a five minute break before we go to our regular meeting in case anybody needs a uh, comfort break or so forth. So let's go ahead and take a five minute break. We'll reconvene at 1010 if that's acceptable. Sure. Okay. We have, do we have donuts. Okay. And yeah, don't forget there are donuts.
Everybody, if we could uh, maybe come back to the table and, and get started. <clears throat> And just another uh, quick note, if we could all come back to the table, please. All right, let's uh, go ahead and uh, start this meeting. This is, <clears throat> and welcome to the uh, Board of Directors meeting for Pikes Peak Area Council of Governments for January 12th. Our first order of business is a uh, call to order and I'm calling the meeting to order and I believe we still have a quorum, is that correct? I... That's correct. Easily. Okay, yep. very good. And uh, we also offer an opportunity here for introductions. Do we have anybody that's uh, a new participant in a PPACG meeting at this point? Uh, we do have Gordon Rick, who's gonna be the alternate for Fountain on there. Um, okay, would, would Gordon like to say a word or two? Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to be uh, participating as an observer and as an alternate. Uh, I spent two years, or excuse me, about a year plus on the PPACG CAC. Uh, so I'm familiar with uh, things that go on here and I look forward to working with everyone in the future. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. I do see uh, another person online, and we, if we could ask uh, Mr. Uh, Dan Jablan to uh, introduce himself. He is our new lobbyist in Denver, and if you have not had a chance to meet with him, he'll introduce himself here. You'll get to know him a little bit, but I would also ask you when you have the time to maybe reach out to him so he can get to know uh, all the board members. Mr. Jablan. Hi, thank you. Uh, yeah, as you said, my name is Dan Jablan. Uh, I'm a new, new lobbyist uh, taking over from Lauren, who's gone on. Uh, to be president and CEO of the Colorado Chamber. Been down in that the, uh, I think this is my 21st session between lobbying in Colorado and New Mexico um, at the Capitol. Looking forward to working with all of you, meeting with all of you. I'm down here now. Um, their speeches are just getting ready to get uh, kicked off at the widget factory across the street from my office. And I look forward to a, a nice year with all of you. Uh, please reach out to me with any questions. I know Jessica has all my contact information. I think she was has forwarded it on to you. And I am open uh, for any questions at any time. So I look forward to working with you. Uh, thank you very much. And thank you for your participation in this uh, board meeting. I'm sure that's uh, helpful to kind of see some of the interests and sentiments of the board. Are there any questions for uh, these two new folks that just introduced themselves from any members of the board? All right, hearing none, let's go ahead and continue. Our first item of business that requires a vote is our agenda approval. Do I have a motion and a second? Yolanda, move to approve the agenda. <laughs> okay, second, Mr. Elsner. Yolanda. Yeah, and Yolanda, uh, you've got the second, thank you. Uh, any comments or questions about the agenda before we vote? All right, hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Are there aye. any opposed? All right, we've got a good agenda. Let's continue with item number three, public comments and presentations. Is there anybody here physically that uh, would like to provide public comments at this point? And hearing none, is there anybody online? All right, and then we also allow um, public comments to be emailed in advance. Do we have any comments that were emailed in advance? Uh, we do not. All right, very good. So uh, item number three is concluded. Let's move to item number four. These are consent items and there are two. Uh, the approval of the minutes from the December 8th, 2021 regulator, or regular meeting <clears throat> and the summary of financials. Are there any comments or questions from any of the board members regarding these two items? All right, and like, I see some pre-coordination going on for the motion and second. <laughs> Go move ahead. to approve the consent items. Second, Eric Stone. All right, that's been moved and seconded. Uh, one last opportunity for comments or questions from any of the board members. Hearing none, let's go ahead and proceed with the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 And are there any opposed? Aye. All right, hearing none, those consent items are now passed. Let's move to item number five. 
And our first action item is 5A, our Area Agency on Aging, the Subcommittee Carryover Funding Approval. Thank you, sir. Good morning. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the board. Uh, Jody Barker here, your Area Agency on Aging Director. And uh, today I'm just bringing uh, before you the uh, technical review subcommittee of the Regional Advisory Council's uh, recommendations for uh, carryover funding. And I thought I'd just give a little bit of a background since this is a little different than what you've seen uh, from us um, before uh, uh, for, for new board members. Um, every year our funding comes to us uh, by the state fiscal year. State funding has to be spent within that fiscal year. However, federal funding that has a balance at the end of that fiscal year may be carried over into the following fiscal year. And so um, this funding, uh, we go through a very similar kind of a mini RFP process to let our providers know that there is funding uh, coming available. We ask them to, um, to lay out their needs. There's a very narrow uh, usage allowance for these funds. Uh, for example, it can only be accessed by currently contracted providers. It has to be used for currently contracted service line items. So they cannot um, uh, recommend a different uh, service than they're currently contracted for, cannot be used for capital expenses, that kind of thing. And so we keep that conversation very narrow as to uh, what they're, they're allowed to use those, fun, those funds for. Um, the carryover that we're looking at today is actually from the 2021 fis state fiscal year. And during that fiscal year, we received an inordinate amount of CARES Act funding with no match requirement with the uh, uh, mandate from the state and the uh, federal organization that oversees our funding that uh, administration on community living that it must be spent first. Therefore, we have a, fair, a fairly significant amount of carryover funding uh, that is uh, coming back into our region uh, right now. And so you'll see there in the memo some additional uh, background information. Um, but what we've done, because there's a very narrow window of time allowed to use the carryover funding as well. It must be spent by June 30th of 2022. And because we uh, rarely know when the carryover funding will actually show up. Um, and this year has been a little bit challenging because of the federal continuing resolution. Um, we, uh, we went ahead uh, as a staff working with our regional advisory council and with our subcommittee, the technical review subcommittee we went ahead and issued that mini RFP, had the discussions, uh, went through the voting process. It has gone to the TRS now. It has gone to the Regional Advisory Council rec with recommendations and voting to approve. Um, and so uh, as it happens, uh, we actually did receive our option letter on Monday. So did not expect that. Um, frankly, we were expecting probably February or March. And so we're well ahead of the game by having already taken these steps internally. Um, our staff uh, also already have um, taken steps to produce the contract amendments. Um, this vote will be the trigger that will allow us to begin distributing these funds. Uh, essentially effective January 1. So our providers uh, who made requests who will receive um, additional funds from the carryover funds will be able to access these uh, moving forward. So uh, a little bit of uh, math for you. Uh, we expected to receive 1,756,586. The actual option letter with some uh, year over year corrections uh, came to uh, $1,757,414. Uh, for a total of actual funds coming back uh, to us, 828 more, $828 more than we had, uh, than we had uh, estimated. And of course, as you know, our uh, finance manager uh, is, is right on. And so it gives us enough room uh, to begin doing that early work uh, to get that out of the way. Um, this year, uh, RFPs, um, of that total, 
um, we received a request totaling $796, excuse me, $796,995.26. There is a page there. Thank you, Jess. Uh, she has that up. You can see uh, of the 17 providers that we currently contract with, eight um, submitted for additional funds for their services for that, uh, for that total. And so, um, uh, again, this has gone through all the appropriate processes with our uh, review subcommittee and the regional advisory council. Uh, this does allow uh, for, um, for a balance of that carryover fund of a uh, little over uh, 959, it'll actually be closer to $960,000 left that we uh, have to make every attempt to spend uh, in services between now and uh, June 30th. So the vote uh, that we are requesting is that uh, you approve the carryover funding recommendations already reviewed and approved by the TRS, uh, confirmed by the Regional Advisory Council. Um, the second part of that request is that we leave that open so that staff working with the TRS may continue to move forward rapidly to distribute the rest of those funds. So there will be ongoing conversations with the, the uh, TRS and the RAC um, to, uh, to both solicit our requests from our providers as well as to uh, get those funds back out. A couple of points as well. The state is going to be um, enacting a 10% cap on carryover, so it is in our best interest to spend um, appropriately and swiftly so that we can maximize the dollars that will be coming back into the region in future years. Um, we will be reporting out the ongoing usage of this, um, and so you will continue to see uh, reports like this from us as we get requests and, um, and uh, go through the process uh, to get those contracts amended. And uh, last point I do want to share that this amount uh, was included in the budget that you recently passed um, for this year. And so you've already seen this, this amount and this estimated amount um, in the most recent budget um, that you approved. So with that, I will leave that to any questions. Great, are there any questions from any of the board members with regard to, to this budget? I see Mr. Zulagi, I might have a question. Yes, sir. Yeah, it's kind of an ancillary question, but um... Are you reaching out to our, our respective uh, regions to let those providers know that these funds are available so that they can maximize the opportunity here? Absolutely. We go through a communication process that immediately, as soon as we knew what the actual amount was or the estimated amount, we reached out to all 17 of our providers. Uh, first, by, uh, by general email saying that it would be available. Then we put together a follow-up meeting uh, requesting everyone's presence uh, at that meeting. We did it by Zoom to maximize uh, the folks that would be able to attend, uh, either directors, program directors, EDs, um, or representatives from their organizations were invited to attend. We talked all about the uh, carryover funding, what it would look like, how it could be used, what it can't be used for. Uh, and we also talked about some additional funding that's, that's gonna be coming in. So we make every attempt um, to make sure that we have either a positive uh, response from them by way of a request or that one of um, either myself most commonly or one of my staff has a negative uh, response from them. So we don't, I, the way I work, I don't like to just leave it out there assuming that they're not responding because they don't want to. I will call the provider and say, do you or don't you? Because I want to hear that so I know I'm not leaving someone out. My Great. follow up question, have you had positive response? Yes, uh, well, we received um, eight eight who requested funds for that $796,000. The others uh, that we heard back from were uh, don't need it, don't have capacity, or the needs that we have currently right now are covered by the current funding, or we'll be making requests for the ARPA funds that will be coming in sometime this spring. So I, we communicated with every single provider. 
what, one of the, if I could just add one of the key uh, driving factors, though, too, the universe of who's eligible to apply for these funds has to be one of our existing AAA aging uh, contractors. So mm -hmm. we're just now starting the process, or we're, we're into the process now for next state fiscal year, July 1, 2022. Correct. So anybody out there in the community in Teller County, they, Teller County Senior Coalition, they know about it, and others that are providing service, now is their time to get in for next state fiscal year to also be eligible for these funds when they come around next year. So the <laughs> It's great that you say that because that was my ne my next thinking is like so okay it's great for the existing providers but what doors open for those who who want to be new providers yeah and so we actually take uh we take folks on waiting lists to make sure that we know that they're interested um and so when the um we did a um a nofa a call for a call for uh, funding availability um we expanded how we've done that in the past um by statute we're mandated to, uh, the only requirement is that it go into one newspaper of each county. What we've done as a staff is reach beyond that. Uh, we've solicited that directly out to current providers, future providers, um, providers that we know have services that we would like to see um, within the area. We've broadened our invitation process. Um, we met with um, several providers who have expressed interest in next year's uh, funding um, so that they could ask questions. We could tell them more about how the process works um, because our goal is to ultimately uh, make sure that there's a broader, even broader scope of services available to our community. So we take every extra step, not just the minimum uh, that we're mandated to by statute. Thank you very much. Certainly, my pleasure. <clears throat> Great, thank you. So uh, any other comments or questions with regard to item 5A? Yes, uh, Mr. Donaldson? How about, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, he's, he had his hand up too. <laughs> and then Mayor will get to you immediately afterwards. <laughs> Jody, yes, you mentioned we would also be um, just receiving updates about other applicants and um, disbursements. Would that be on a monthly basis each month from going forward? We're going to yep. get that. We'll we'll probably put it into uh, either into our uh, regional advisory council uh, uh, update that gets included in your packet. That'll probably be the easiest way to make sure that you have that information. Mm -hmm. um, our goal is to make that a continuing conversation every month because we want them to access that funding. We want them to 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 be able to use that and spend that down because that is money that is already that already belongs to region four. It's just a year later. So yeah. as far as um, reporting out, yeah, I'll include it in, in my report. We'll have it in the RAC report, but I'll make sure I bring it up each month too. So, you know, yeah. so okay. there may Thank be you. some months that we don't yeah. have anything, but we will make sure you have what we have. Yes, sir. Great. Eric Thompson. Yes, I just want to make a comment. I really appreciate your approach of broadening it. I believe when I first got on PPCG eight or so years ago, it was pretty much the same people few, very few providers um, annually every year. And, and I'm just always excited every year to see new providers and find out about them. I believe we have a meeting with a new provider mm -hmm. sometime in the next couple of weeks. And um, I just think it's it's great to see that many uh, new people come and flowing through. And then some come and go, they're on a year, then they're off a year and, and that's okay. But um, I, I appreciate that approach. Thank you very much. Thank you, I appreciate that. We, we have enacted several um, new, uh, processes to make sure that we do uh, both expand the service availability, uh, making sure that people understand the expectations of the of the process, the funding, uh, what it can be used for, what it can't, um, and our goal is to just continue to to manage that as best possible. Great, thank you. Any other questions? All right, very good. I'll entertain a motion for item five A. Motion so to accept the RAC recommendation of immediate funding dispersing and con contingency plan for the remaining funds to meet the usage deadline of June 30th, 2022. Don Wilson. Uh, Robert Zulawaga, Woodland Park, second. All right, we have a motion and a second. Uh, one last opportunity for any of the board members to provide additional comments or have any questions. I don't see any hands raised uh, online, just making sure, but I think we're good. All right, um, I'll have some comments after the vote, but they'll be very brief, but uh, let's go ahead and proceed with the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 And are there any, is there anyone opposed? All right, uh, no opposition, so that passes, thank you. Just a couple of quick comments. I do wanna express 
uh, my appreciation, and I think I can speak on behalf of the board, the board's appreciation for the Area Agency on Aging over the last couple of years, the tough work that you've been doing, taking care of our seniors through a really, really difficult environment with COVID. Um, there's a lot of isolation issues that are connected with that, and I know it's been tough on the seniors. And I, I know that you've actually called our clients from time to time, just kind of sanity checks, making sure that they're okay. And I appreciate that. And I have a comment after that, but if you'd like to comment on that point. Sir, uh, thank you. I, I appreciate hearing that. Um, we called uh, uh, clients uh, in the beginning uh, of 2020 uh, who had come to us for other reasons, but wanted to make sure that they knew what other services were available within the community, not just with us. Um, until um, uh, we continued that uh, into the fall of 2020 until they started asking us to stop calling. Um, and so um, I will say though that um, nearly every single one of our other uh, uh, contractors, uh, providers uh, began the same program. And so it wasn't just the PPACG staff and volunteers making those calls, every single provider uh, ramped up a reassurance program. It looked a little bit differently, um, but making sure that folks were reached out to in their in their communities, uh, they engaged with uh, City of Fountain. In fact, uh, offered up about a hundred um, uh, city staff members to stay busy at home by calling folks in the in the uh, Fountain area just to get connected, make sure that they knew what services were available, or just to chat, just a friendly ear, because they were not allowed to be out of their home at that early time. And so we're very proud about uh, the reassurance program and just how it's expanded. Uh, and, and for many of those providers, it continues. Thank, Thank you. you. And, you know, I, I want to make one, one additional comment here because I think it's kind of interesting. Uh, you know, my, my mom is a senior living in another state and lives by herself and is not very mobile and kind of is in a delicate situation. If she were to fall, it would be a, a real challenge for her. And she is aging in place in her home that she loves. Um, but I've been very worried about that because she doesn't have any relatives that live nearby that can come by and see her every day, right? So I found out that that community actually has an automated call system uh, where um, any, uh, any senior can submit an application and if approved, and it's pretty easy to get approved, you, uh, you get a phone call uh, from an automated system. So the way that works is my mom gets a phone call at 10 o'clock every day uh, and if she's fine, she presses one. And if she's not fine, she presses two. And if there's no answer, they call back a second time 10 minutes later and go through the same process. And if there's no response to either, then some type of emergency service comes out. And if uh, she presses two at any of those times, an emergency service comes out. I just wanted to mention that uh, over the Christmas holidays, my mom mentioned to me, I set that up for her. My mom mentioned to me how grateful she is to have that service because it means that um, uh, she's got, you know, if something were to happen to her, she knows she's got to survive to that 10 o'clock uh, on that day to be able to respond. And I would like to maybe suggest maybe there it'd be worthwhile to do some research here and see if a similar program might be uh, uh, of value. And I don't really know what the numbers are or the costs are, or if there's a liability implication that's not good for us or what have you. So I'm not taking a position one way or another for us, but it, maybe if I could ask the staff to kind of uh, contemplate that idea, or maybe if you already know of some people that are doing it and it's something you've been thinking about. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, it's always good to hear those projects that, that do work. Um, and so um, I'd be very happy to dig into that. And if I could get with you after the, the meeting, perhaps, and find out where that program is, then we can just go right to the service provider. Uh, there are several of our providers who do live calls uh, with their clients. Uh, we also have the Reassurance Plus program uh, through Silver Key Senior Services, but as you know, they uh, serve the El Paso County area. So uh, we'd love to dig into this and find out more. So thank you very much for bringing that to my attention. You're welcome. It's just uh, pro providing an idea about a personal experience I had with my mom that may or may not be appropriate for our community, but it's probably worth doing the research. And I saw Mr. Zulaga, you had your hand raised. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I have a, not a similar story, but a, a testament from a fellow who went to visit his dad. He's uh, in independent living, uh, which is um, the next step is, is assisted living in the same building. And so he went to see him, knocked on the door, no answer, knocked on the door, no answer, uh, finally got uh, access to his dad's apartment. 
and his dad had been on the floor in the bathroom for the last two days. So, and then his dad says he begged him not to tell them because if he did, they would move him into uh, assisted living. He didn't want that. So I love what your suggestion is. And, and the reason I have asked to uh, speak is I, I want to carry the water for you more effectively in my region. So um, can you provide a list of the current providers? And I'd like to take it to council and say, um, there is a lot of funds available. What can we do? Where are the gaps we see? Because in our community, we have an increasing number of aging folks. So maybe offline or whatever I'd like Certainly, I, I'm available right after the meeting. So, um, yeah, there, there are a couple of routes that we could go with that. And that's, uh, that, that is a challenge because sometimes those safeguards are put into place, but the follow-up to those safeguards sometimes are consequences that the individual does not want for themselves. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so that is, that is uh, also in and of itself a challenge because we're here to advocate for that individual and advocacy and protection uh, carry very different uh, roles and responsibilities. And so I appreciate hearing that because that is a reality for, for certain. So. Well, Keith, uh, just if I can follow on that, I worked with a fiduciary for a number of years and we would deal with aging and, uh, respecting their freedom is a real big deal. And once you start taking away, you start taking away the driver's license, you start taking away their personal care and stuff. That's delicate area because part of that's their well-being mentally. And you start taking that away and it doesn't help them. Very true. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Gardine. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem, Lone Gardine, Callahan. Uh, our community is has a lot of senior citizens in it and they have a lot of pride. Okay, but if you have a personal contact, call them like you, know, you were talking about here. They feel like the people reaching out to them, but we only have one uh, point of contact, and that's the pantry. Okay, so we need to be able to let uh, they trust the pantry. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, but uh, I think that uh, this would be a very good program for like for town of Camlin for sure. Okay, so and uh, the, these people, men. Uh, we all men uh, come together as a community, helping each other. Okay, a lot of these people, men, don't want you to know their business. Okay, <laughs> and so then they want, uh, but if you men, if they feel like they have a, uh, an idea on, on what's going on, they mean accept it more. If I may share, uh, uh, one of our one of our providers uh, based in Cripple Creek at the Aspen Mine Center. So you know kind of extrapolating also rural area people don't want others to know their business especially uh, potentially a service provider they actually set up their reassurance program with volunteers so volunteers make those calls and they have a personal chat and those those volunteers have been trained to listen for for certain keywords or concerns um, in which case then they ask that individual for permission to to get them further information around services or, or other needs but it's it's really uh, approached as a just a friendly touch a friendly encounter to make sure that individual um, uh, has that contact that they need so thank you for that input because we, we actually work with uh, with the pantry with the FEMA box distribution um, twice this year and this well, year. I, know, I know in our town that you would have a, a, a lot of people would volunteer to do that and uh, that you'd actually have a lot of community involvement so uh, if you could uh, give me your information so I could uh, and I'll go down and talk to the pantry and make sure to uh, break do anything I can to help Thank you. I appreciate that. Great. Thank you very much. Great comments from the board members. I appreciate it. Appreciate uh, your coming forward. And it uh, looks like uh, you you have the uh, votes that you need to go ahead and proceed with uh, getting those uh, funds carried over. Thank you. I appreciate it. My staff member is waiting to hear from me now. She's ready. <laughs> so we, we will get these uh, out into the community ASAP. Thank you. Outstanding. Thank you very much. Uh, so let's go ahead and move on to item 5B. This is our TIP adoption, uh, Dan Danielle Miller. Good morning. Um, as you all know, PPACG has been in the development of a new transportation improvement program for um, fiscal years 2023 through 2027. Uh, we have brought this to the board a few times previously. We um, went through our public 
participation process and had our public hearing um, here at the board last month. Um, the PPACG uh, TAC and CAC have recommended adoption of the 2327 tip, and that's why we're here today. And if you have any questions. Very good. Are there any questions from the board with regard uh, to this uh, tip adoption, the 2023-2027 tip adoption? All right, hearing none, I'll entertain a motion. I would move approval of the 23 to 2023 to 2027 TIP program. Second. That's been moved and seconded. One last opportunity for any questions or comments from any of the board members. And I'm looking online and I don't see any hands raised, just making sure. All right, hearing none, let's go ahead and proceed with the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Is there anybody opposed? All right, congratulations. Uh, that is now adopted. Thank you very much. Let's move on to item number six, our information items. And the first one is item 6A, the CDOT 10 year plan. And I think John, you're up. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, members of the board, uh, this item is your sort of first bite at the apple or letting you know the apple is coming. That's probably the best way of putting it, right? Next month, we will bring it back, hopefully as an information item. And then the following month, in March, we'll bring it as an action item. So, but again, depending on um, the tech work on it, um, it might be, we'll bring it back in March as an information item and then an action item in April. Um, we've had great support from CDOT and I just had a, a call with uh, Wendy trying to nail down the schedule. Um, and she definitely wants to make sure that we're, we're comfortable moving forward. So we appreciate all her hard work in getting us information and, and being a conduit uh, uh, for us here in the region uh, between us and uh, the CDOT uh, headquarters. So some of you are new on the board. Let me take the 50,000 foot level, kind of let you know what the 10, the 10 year plan is intended to do um, within the, the NPO area. And again, this goes back to our earlier conversation where there's 15 transportation planning regions within um, the state of Colorado. TPR number one, which is the Pikes Peak TPR, encompasses the NPO region or Metropolitan Planning Organization. That means it's got a population of over 50,000 um, and has certain federal rules that are attached to that. We're actually over 200,000, so our transportation management area, and we even have a little, some more rules on top of that. Anything outside of that TPR number one, which is center of the donut of our COG, um, ooh, donuts, no, um, is uh, Central Front Range TPR, um, which again is uh, uh, Commissioner Elsner and, and uh, uh, that area. So of the 16 P uh, PPACG jurisdictions, nine of you are in the MPO and seven of you are in uh, the Central Front Range. When we do our long range plan for the MPO, we identify um, projects, that are gonna be done in the next 20 to 25 years. Um, and again, that's, those are the things that we're, we're planning on doing. Included in that are the CDOT projects within the Central Front Range. And they don't, aren't required to have a long range plan per se like an MPO, but they're covered under, or the, the seven of you that are covered under that, you're under the, uh, 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 the state process uh, that, that, that happens. And then um, when a project is actually approved and ready to be done, there's what we call the TIP, which is what you just adopted, where we say, this is the, the projects we're moving forward with. Well, we have a TIP within that, again, that MPO area. There's also a, a state transportation improvement program or STIP that falls within the folks that are in the central front range. So there's that little sort of step in between that we call this the CDOT 10 year plan, where CDOT and their planning partners for the NPO, it's, it, it's us here at PPACG. For those of you in Central Front Range, uh, you work directly with the, uh, the CDOT planning staff. We identify the projects um, that are sort of ready to go. Our last 10 year plan, we had enough funds to do about the first four years. That was the funded part of the plan. And the rest were sort of put down there 
in priority order in case, and this is the term of art, I believe they'll use at CDOT, money falls from the sky. That that way they can go down that project list and, and provide projects. So the exercise in front of us now is to take the projects that are completed, move them off the list, sort, and then sort of reshuffle the list based on our current priorities. So our current 10 year plan, um, for example, we had powers and research on there. And again, thanks to all of your vision here on the board, we were able to complete that about two years faster than we had originally anticipated. So that one is off the list because it's completed or, or it shouldn't say completed, but from a financial standpoint, it's been completely 100% funded and therefore can be removed from the list. Um, and then we can start looking at other priorities. So the exercise that's happening at the TAC right now is CDOT is bringing us through the projects that they're willing and able to do. And then our TAC committee, the Transportation Advisory Committee is saying, these are our priorities and how we look at it. The federal transportation planning process is a cooperative process. CDOT can't do projects in your area unless you approve it through the TIP. Uh, but conversely, you can't compel CDOT to do projects they don't wanna do. So it's this cooperative uh, process, this Venn diagram of what they're willing to do versus what we want to do, where we sort of meet in the middle and we develop priorities. So right now, that's what we're doing. We're developing this, this 10 year list. Um, and at this point, um, CDOT has brought the, 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 uh, the sort of the initial salvo or the initial list um, uh, through the TAC process. We had a great meeting where we've, we chatted through um, a lot of the nuances of the project. Uh, they've had a couple of recommendations and CDOT now has gone back and is going to sort of redevelop the list. So hopefully the next TAC meeting will finalize the first draft and then we can bring it back to you uh, next month. So again, we're telling you this now. So if there's something in particular that you really want to know or see about the different plan, you can talk to your TAC representative, or again, uh, we can chat about it here uh, over the months to come. You can contact me and we, we, can, we can work that out. Um, on the phone today or on the uh, uh, participating in the meeting being Zoom, that's my 50,000 foot level. But we've got Wendy Pettit that can sort of talk about things if you want to get down to the, the parcel level. And if you really want to dig into the weeds about some specific projects, uh, we've got uh, John Hall, um, who is uh, with the engineering staff with CDOT that can talk about specific projects and where they're at if we plan on bringing them or not bringing them um, in the future. Uh, but again, uh, our hope today is to sort of stay up here at this 50,000 foot level. Uh, but you are the board and this is America. And if you want to get in the weeds, we will get in the weeds. Uh, so with that, open it up for any questions. And if it's uh, permissible from the chair, if CDOT has to, would like to say anything that I've missed, I'm happy to have them uh, chime in. Certainly. Are there, um, I do have one question, but I'll reserve that in case any other board members uh, have an interest in a, uh, asking a question or making a comment. Go ahead, uh, Commissioner Williams. Well, I guess minor kind of questions versus points. Um, so I uh, counted on this list, 11 projects are bridges over Powers Boulevard. That's a fascinating point. <laughs> I love that Simon and Garfunkel song, yes. Well, and you know, it's really interesting because it's it still represents the fact that our transportation system is following the growth, not anywhere near coming close to when it needs it. And so that's, that's pretty frustrating. Um, I am one project that's not on there, which I've been just bringing up for my county engineer's attention is Highway 105 through Palmer Lake. I think that's a CDOT road, but um, you know, we need to monitor the traffic on that once the gap is done, because it's been a total disaster for two years. It completely torn up because of all the Yes, so that was kind of one of the big bypasses uh, for the gap. So that one's been a, a, a continuing problem up in that region. But um, I just kind of want to get a, give a heads up. Um, project number seven is um, Hov Lanes. <laughs> and it's, uh, it's toll lanes in Colorado Springs. 
And um, so that one is between Cimarron and North Nevada. And then down in the gray area is all the way up to Briargate. And um, so uh, if, if CDOT's really gonna push us in that direction, which I fully expect they are, um, then we need to do some serious uh, work on that because we know what we experienced after the gap and the toll lanes. And we've really worked hard at the Pikes Peak RTA to keep El Paso County free you know, of, of the toll lane, you'll notice they start as you go over Monument Hill, but not before you go over Monument Hill. So the, so. Um, the, the tech actually, I believe, uh, started that conversation on both the toll lanes and I wanna say 105, but I can't remember that exactly. So the list that you have was prior to our, our TAC meeting, but I think they've already uh, brought up those concerns and now that's part of the iterative process. But I do believe the recommendation on the toll lanes was to move it down in priority. And I believe there was some discussion of where we were at on 105, but I could be mistaken. Uh, but I do seem to remember there was that conversation that the county already brought up. So John, this is uh, Richard Zamora. So, and 83, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, just one thing I, I did want to bring that up because you know the HOV lanes right now, you know, another section we're looking at and we're, we're talking about prioritizing higher within the region is actually from South Academy. Um, down south, uh, or actually between South Academy and up the circle, um, which is the current remaining two lane stretch kind of in between uh, a little bit north of where MAMSIP is going on right now. So, you know, we definitely want to have those conversations with you. Um, and, you know, from our perspective, given the narrowness and, and some of those kinds of things in that area, it might be a higher priority from our perspective. I think one other thing I just wanted to bring up again is I still don't have uh, planning totals yet to be able to work with. Um, and so, of course, you know, whatever makes a list is ultimately going to have to be dependent upon how much money we have. Um, and I'm hoping to have that information sometime soon, but there's still ongoing discussion about that. I have uh, one comment, though, back. Um, I'm more talking about the public perception and the public resistance to the toll lanes or the HOV lanes. Um, there is so much need for that widening from, you know, probably uh, just as you get on at Woodman going south all the way down to uh, that South Academy exit. So we can't, we're going to have to find a compromise somewhere because we can't ignore the fact that that road needs to have an additional lane on it. And so um, if we have to strategize about how best to handle that um, highway, the high occupancy vehicle lane, then we need to do that um and somehow come up to a, a political media type strategy on that because we can't not prioritize getting that freeway widened yeah again you know i think the widened. challenge is going to be is trying to get everything accomplished within the amount of money that we have um you know and, and that's going to have to be where we we really you know put pencil to paper in terms of what is the highest priority for the region so great is exactly why the roads in Palmer Lake are so trashed because people, instead of paying the toll, are still going to go around trashing 105 and so much traffic in town and trucks. We're getting huge semis coming through because they're not going to want to pay the toll. The traffic is not going to go away in Palmer Lake. And um, we'll see what happens when the toll comes into effect in next January. I, you know, um, we'll see how that that should be improving as they as they complete up the gap and hopefully we can keep a close eye on that at the county. Um, but the uh, rich when I um, have my dream I will make sure that if I'm ever governor 50% of the first three budgets go to CDOT so but that's <laughs> not ever going to happen so you know don't don't think that's a promise. <laughs> T maybe maybe Richard might be your first vote then. So yeah. oh I, I would definitely support that. Um, you know, I'm just trying to temper expectations a little bit here right now, just you know, having a, a general understanding of how much money is available. So yes, I think uh Mr. Donison, do you have a comment? Just, yeah, a question just for clarification is uh on that same item that uh Commissioner Williams was talking about, is HOV lanes uh synonymous with toll? And I appreciate that comment because I had the same, I have the same comment. I've got some others too, but I've got that one as well because I'll tell you when it says HOV, 
that means to me HOV and HOV only. And it means there's no consideration from CDOT for that to be a toll lane. And I feel this is really important. If, if CDOT is intending on that added lane to be an HOV and a toll lane, I'm very interested in the documentation saying that. So, because I felt as much as we've got a great relationship with CDOT and there's so many fantastic things going on, I felt like we got hoodwinked a little bit on the gap where you may all remember this, but um, there was no toll lane intended. Then we were told that there would be some research about whether it should or should not be a toll lane. And then literally the week after El Paso County voted to financially support it, the week after within seven days, that's when CDOT announced it was going to be a toll lane as well. And I felt like we got hoodwinked. I don't know if it was just a circumstance of unfortunate timing or what have you, but I didn't like it. <laughs> so uh, this says HOV right now. And to me, that means HOV and HOV only. And there's no intention for CDOT to make that a toll lane. So if that's wrong, uh, I'm interested in getting clarification on it. So I would have to say that is likely wrong, uh, Commissioner. Um, you know, typically when we add any kind of capacity, we look at all options available to us, which includes tolls or express lanes, managed express lanes. So there is potential that at some point it could become a managed express lane. You know, again, it, the, the limits of this particular project are, you know, they're not short, you know, they're a decent length, but still you got to look at logical termini and a lot of those other things too. So there's, there's a lot of work we got to do in order to make that kind of decision right now. Yeah. So I appreciate that. You know, I, I think, Kind of the way you, the, why uh, Mr. Samora, you're, you're hedging your comments a little bit is it's perhaps has to be made at the uh, state administration level or something. But it's my understanding that the Transportation Commission intends on everywhere across the state making any lane addition on a highway a toll lane. So um, y'all can correct me if I'm wrong, but that's what I, I, I've heard that. And I guess I don't have confirmation one way or another, but that is what I believe is their intention. So I guess it, if, if the official decision isn't made, but it's a 99% chance that's going to be a toll lane, which is probably where it is, um, I think I would like to have the word toll added to that line uh, so that everybody knows what it is. I don't know if we can maybe do that. Um, so we're just going to have a little section of town where we collect tolls? That's apparently what it's going to be. Um, now, keep in mind, it's I mean, adding... Are we going to do it little section by little section by little section until eventually from the border to the Pueblo border yeah. we have tolls? I'm just going to say it publicly. Why not, right? Are we going to do it in little sections at a time? That's what it shows on the list. Yeah. Just a little section. It does show on the list. It'll be little section by little section because it has to be some a manageable project. Right. So um, I would go and say it's an HOV lane slash luxury lane. Yeah. Because some of us are are impatient and not that good of drivers, so some of us sometimes pay extra to drive in the toll lane. <laughs> so yeah, and I, and I'll I'll make the point. Uh, uh, I think I can make um, an effective advocacy argument for it not to be a toll lane. That the toll lane actually adds to congestion. I mean, yes, you're adding a third lane, and that's you know, or fourth lane, or whatever it is in that section, and that's all good. But um, I, I'm not entirely sure that I agree with uh, the state's position that guaranteed reliability is a higher priority. Uh, than uh, addressing uh, 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 um, user wait times and user safety. So when we, when we add a third lane and we take a guaranteed reliability as a higher priority than those, I, I'll just make the point, I think that's uh, not appropriate. Having said that, that you know, we may or may not have much control over that. It's a CDOT road, but if it's, if there's, if it's a strong consideration, it's gonna be a toll lane. Let's make sure we put the word toll on there, because I'll tell you what, what happened to El Paso County, uh, the commissioners, when this was discussed. We were not hearing tolling. We were hearing HOV, HOV. Okay, great. Um, then one week after we voted on it, uh, CDOT comes out and says toll lane. And within 30 days of that, I got 250 emails from citizens and constituents saying they felt that they got hoodwinked and they were blaming the El Paso County commissioners for it. Mm -hmm. that, that's actually what happened to us. 
So, so uh, understood, Commissioner. I think we can modify project descriptions and those kinds of things too. Um, you know, and, and and make it more clear in terms of what would potentially be considered on the project. You know, again, this is all going to have to play out. As I mentioned, you know, there's there's some discussion even from CDOT about you know adding another project on I-25 in a different area, and whether or not this you know that takes the place of this project uh, as a higher priority. Um, and those kinds of things too. So I think there's still a lot of conversation that needs to happen within the TAC as well. Um, but we can definitely modify the project description to address your concern. Yeah, and, and trust me, I am very, very interested in that additional lane. I think we, we really need it. I just want it to be described as to what it's likely to be. So that, that's the point there. I do have one other, uh, maybe Mr. Donaldson, I don't know if you had further comments or not. Okay, I do have one other uh, point um, with regard to the PPACG priorities. This is item number four. But actually, I'll just go through the number one, number two, and number three. I've got a pretty good understanding on exactly what those are. On number four, I don't know much about what this um, Excel decel lane and median widening project is. It sounds great, but I just don't know much about it. So I'd be interested in uh, getting back filled on that. It looks like maybe Commissioner Williams, you might have some additional information, but maybe if there's similar sentiment on the board that we don't know too much about this one. Maybe we can get a specific presentation on that particular project. Well, that Commissioner one's Williams. pretty easy to explain. That one's between Fillmore and Garden of the Gods. Am I right? Yeah. I turned off the agenda item. Yeah, but... it is Fillmore to Garden of the Gods. And it's it's an acceler. It, I mean, it's exactly what's described in the description. It's an acceleration lane and a deceleration lane. So basically, yeah. we're taking the weave um, out of the main through lanes providing an area to, to weave in Excel and Excel to get off at the, both those interchanges. Okay. Yeah, so and if you're driving there um, north, you will notice that right after Fillmore, you lose that um, extra lane to get on the freeway. And that is because the bridge um, over a small road there off of Sinton Road that connects Sinton to Chestnut never got widened. It is, and that's probably because of the expense of having to work with the railroad there. But it's, um, so it literally is not wide enough to handle the extra acceleration and deceleration lane. So what it is every night is it's a funnel point and in the morning too, as people are coming to work on Garden of the Gods, especially to our county facility there, um, they're funneling, having to funnel down and then get up and then funnel back because there's not that extra lane to go in and out and get off the lane. So they'll replace the bridge. There's been a bid out on that. And I think a contract issued on that. And then that will add into um, that extra. So that funnel point will go away. Since that's my drive home, I'll be very happy about that. Great. Um, so. I appreciate that description. <laughs> that might be actually sufficient for me, but I see Mr. Donaldson, you have your hand raised. Well, I was going to suggest real quick too, if, if anybody has specific questions about this project, John Hall, who's the resident engineer for it, is on the call as well. So, Okay, thank you. Uh, I was just going to add, Mr. Chair, that uh, I did get a briefing from CDOT on this project as a city councilman who represents that part of town, and it is, as uh, Commissioner Williams described it, simply widening the road on both sides, north and south, to uh, give a strip to pull off and also so that people aren't forced to, you know, fight to get out into the traffic. Okay, great. And it is, if I understand right, it is on the list of funded projects and will start summer of this year. Is that correct? Great. So that's, that's awesome. I think I saw another hand, Mr. Zulaga. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So uh, I have one is a question about what's on the list and that's uh, looks like it's uh, just off the current priority and that's the, uh, Item number, well, seven, I guess, um, Colorado 67 North of Woodland Park, safety and drainage. Is that the area between Evergreen and Kelly Road, or is that the uh, decel lane over at Research? Mr. Hall, can you uh, drive into uh, the weeds on that one? <laughs> would, would you, Colorado 67 North of Woodland Park, it is is that what we're talking about? Yes, sir. I, I'm, I'm totally on. I, I, I didn't grasp the second location you're talking about, but this is, I mean, just what it says north of Woodland Park, there's uh, 67, you know, heads up north into Douglas County and it, just various, various improvements to, on that, on that section of road. Well, um, do you have the limits to where it starts and where it ends, John? Correct. I don't have the exact mile posts that we're, that we're talking about. I, I, mean, I believe, I, sorry, I do not have, I do not have that. 
Well, because you're saying safety and drainage, I'm I'm suspecting that's the proposed part between Evergreen and um, or County Road and and Kelly Road. You just installed lights at Kelly Road uh, this past year, and uh, there it just drops off on either side, so it's single lane either side and ice and snow. Folks end up in a ditch. So I didn't know if that's the project you're referring to or the one where we have a D cell lane a little further up uh, at Research Road where there's some uh, proposed uh, safety improvements there that you're doing in conjunction well, with the city. Well, I, I, I believe the concept here is, is, is all is any, we're looking at that whole area and in, in terms of, I mean, there's, there's not, I don't believe a specific scope element at this point. I think that's, I think it's all of that is being looked at as, and what would be the best, you know, designing what would be the best, uh, you know, point locations within there. Um, Maybe I can talk with you later about it because I think it's already uh, well defined what that is, and I just uh, was trying to get a clarity of uh, if that's actually going to move into the uh, priority list uh, because it's been on it's been on a planning for a while. Okay, I'll, so I'll if we can talk about that afterward, that's fine. Yeah, I, I I just have to get with the probably with the the other. Yeah, I'm sorry, I don't I don't know that one in in detail right now. Okay, thank you. My second point is um, we have a study for a reliever route for the uh, for the uh, Woodland Park, Teller County, going out to the west uh, western slopes, so uh, in all of the recreation areas. So my question is, what is it? So we've got a, a study coming this uh, in 2023. Uh, if that all goes well, what does it take to then get onto this uh, ten-year planning uh, schedule? for that to be a, a go-ahead project. So, I mean, that would that would funnel through actually PPACG um, in terms of how it falls on the priority list. So, um, you know, as of right now, I don't know if we have a good scope um, and budget for what that would look like necessarily because we're still doing the preliminary work. Um, but that is something that, you know, could potentially be considered. Um, and again, this isn't the last shot at the apple either. We're planning on updating this periodically you know, as we get projects off, trying to maintain a 10-year list of projects, it helps us plan our design efforts and, and that kind of work going forward, so. Yeah, and if I might just put a, a finer point on that, uh, uh, council member. So at this point, you need to do your study. Once you've done your study and you actually have an alignment that will let you do sort of that, the preliminary engineering and, just, and, and sort of the, the scoping of the project. So once you know where it sits, then you know, is it a $10 million project? Is it a $15 million project? Is it a $20 million project? And uh, what sort of um, drainage issues does it have? What sort of right-of-way issues does it have? After that first project is done, then your next challenge is then finding the money to do to the, the design. So the design phase of that project is something that could be put on this list when it is quote unquote ready to go. Remember what I said, this is the, if money falls from the sky, these are projects that are ready to go. So right now your um, study is, like I said, getting, is getting worked through the, the process. But once that's done, then your design phase will be quote unquote ready to go and is a candidate to be put on a future list. Too soon to put it on now. Right. And then after that's done and you actually then have your environmental clearances and all that stuff, and you're ready to go for construction, all you then need is uh, the funding to do it, then that construction would be a candidate to fall on this list. So, but those are things that are down the line. It would be premature to put anything on this list at this date until those two particular things happen. Does that help with? Uh, oh, very helpful, thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair? Yes. If there, are, if there are no more questions, I just wanna put, uh, two more little things on the table. Um, we are also looking at a transit list. So remember, um, as we go through this process, if there's any particular transit um, projects you want to see um, uh, changed to the list or added to the list, uh, please let us know. Um, big thanks to Brian Vitulli of uh, Mountain Metro Transit and uh, Jeff from uh, CDOT for helping us with the, uh, the different uh, transit elements of the list. And then finally, I will say that this um, particular process has we move forward. Remember, this is just a list of what our priorities are. 
it is not saying that you, when we adopt this, you as a board are saying, this is our list and we're done with it. Because as we go through the process, because of the greenhouse gas rule, there is conceivable that we will have an, uh, an item that we will actually have to sit and all come together and say, because of the greenhouse gas rule, we only have so much capacity for capacity projects. We can only do one project that widens a road. And then you all will have to decide, will that be a PPRTA project? Will that be a uh, project in the city of Colorado Springs? Or will that be a CDOT project? So just by having something on the list is not carte blanche that the, I probably used that incorrectly, but it, it's not a fait accompli, ooh, that's better, that that project is definitely going to happen. All it says is right now, given the circumstances, these are our priorities. But there are lots of things that could change our priorities through our planning process. So I just wanted to make sure that everybody understood there could be some more very difficult decisions because of the greenhouse gas rule that will come back to you in, in the future. So hopefully that's helpful. Uh, thank you for that. I'll just <clears throat> make the point. I hope that we don't find ourselves in having to make those kinds of difficult decisions. Let's let's see what we can do to, to prevent that. Um, but anyway, case, thank you for the update. Are there any further questions with regard to this information item? We, we put some time into this, but there were a lot of excellent questions. So I appreciate that. I also noted, I think there was a, um, a comment from Wendy from uh, CDOT um, uh, region two with regard to the Woodland Park study that you were just talking about. And she made the point that funding starts for that in 2024. And that was a text item uh, from the chat. There it is right there. So Mr. Zulaga, you're probably interested in that point. <laughs> yeah, July, 20, July 2024. Okay, very good. Let's move on to 6B. Our uh, air quality and ozone update. Okay, thank you, Chair. And I'll take this and I'll try to be brief. Um, and really just looking for direction in your preliminary okay today to bring a letter back in February for the board to approve for us to send to the state around our ozone emissions levels that we've seen the past couple of years within our, within our region. Um, we're not currently meeting the standard primarily because of really bad numbers that we've seen in 2020 and 2020. One, um, for ground level ozone, it comes from a lot of different sources. It comes from tailpipe emissions, power generation, manufacturing processes, but then wildfire impacts um, exacerbate those numbers too. So we've seen that that's had a real impact on this the past couple of years. In conversations I've had with um, air quality division staff at CDPHE, they think we can make a, a decent case. They can help make a good case for us to for the wildfires that we saw in our state in August of 2020, when we had the three biggest wildfires in state history by land area, um, to petition EPA to have those classified as what's called exceptional events, that nobody had any control over managing those and those negatively impacted our air quality numbers to a level that it really pushed us up uh, well above the federal standard. And we've been living with that number for a couple of years now because it's based on a rolling three-year average when we identify what our emissions levels are. Um, they suggested it would help a lot if we, if our board sends a letter to the state, which would actually go to the head of the Air Quality Control Division and probably the governor. And my suggestion is that we do this sooner rather than later, but to ask the state to petition EPA to have those uh, wildfire events in August of 2020 classified as exceptional events. Um, it, it's a, a big ask in some ways, but uh, the CDPHE staff thinks there's enough justification to make it happen. They're not gonna make the request if they don't think it makes a difference as far as our numbers. And they said they believe it will. If those numbers are no longer part of our overall three-year average, then we drop down below where we're still technically close, but we're meeting the standard. Um, my suggestion is that we probably also need to identify in a letter that we would send to, to the state, um, what are some other kind of proactive measures that we're doing as a region to try to get a control around ozone emissions? Uh, a lot of good work by the city, by CSU utilities, um, with power generation that, that could help that we could point to. And I've had some good conversations with the ROM already about that. Um, we're looking at some other things like a voluntary trip reduction program that's tied in more with the greenhouse gas emissions rulemaking mitigation uh, requirements that may be coming, but there's co-benefits there with ozone emissions too. So I think there's a few things like that that we can really point to as proactive measures, trying to go after wildfire grants 
uh, to do wildfire mitigation, I think certainly would um, would help as well. So I think those are some of the items that we would identify in a letter that we submit. Um, so just wanted to give you a heads up, but also looking for some preliminary feedback to see if we're on the right track. My suggestion is probably the next step is um, we'll work to draft something up. And what I'd like to do is pull in the air quality technical committee that we have as well and get their feedback at their meeting in um, end of January and then bring this back to the board in, in February. Um, but 2022 being an election year, I think the sooner we do this, the better. If we're going to make, if you have to make a petition, a request to the governor, especially, so um, that would be my recommendation. Yeah. Um, thank you. Uh, uh, there may be comments from the other board members, but I'll, I'll make the point. I, I appreciate that uh, CDPHE has a willingness to work with us on that and maybe make an appeal for these exceptional events. I do consider them to be appropriate exceptional events as well. And uh, my recommendation is that we proceed forward as a board um, to to continue that pathway and, and get to that request to EPA for to get the exceptional events identified. Mr. Stone. Yeah, I would agree with your comments and just a simple question. Do you need action from the board or a simple head nod to move ahead? Today, simple head nod is, is fine. I'm um, nodding my head, thank you. Super, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Zulaga, and I see a head nod also from Mr. Donaldson and you'll get a head nod from me. I see a head nod from Mr. Elsner. There's probably more head nods coming. Uh, I see one from our representative from, Ms. from the town of Calhan and now Mr. Zulaga, go ahead. And you have a head nod for me as well, you have a verbal, but I would just want to suggest that um, another area of exception that we might like to pose and include is uh, foreign pollution from fire, from fire or smoke, uh, whether it comes from California, Oregon, China, wherever else. I mean, the, is there a way to uh, isolate and identify particulates that are coming from outside our region that we are being asked to look at as our own. It's like it, we have no capacity at all to mitigate those. So is there a way of in the letter also uh, having that reviewed and considered? I doubt that's gonna make a difference in all honesty. There's been one other request of the governor to make a petition to EPA to get an exceptional classification. And it was around that very issue. And I think it was in 2018, 2019 and he didn't support it. The suggestion from CDPHE staff is to be really narrowly focused on those numbers that we think that we know will really make a difference. And it was about a 10 day period in August of 2020 that we can point to, to say these really drove our numbers up. So I think if we narrow our focus, I think our chances of success are probably a little bit better, um, especially understanding that that's, um, that, that's been attempted before trying to identify the, the foreign uh, sources of pollution, which hasn't been supported. And, and I would say uh, for this particular effort, particularly if we have CDPHE interest in proceeding, we should uh, work towards getting that done. However, uh, Mr. Zulaga, I completely agree with your point. I, I, it makes absolutely no sense to me to go ahead and harm our own economy because of somebody else's pollution. I mean, you know, well, let's just let China pollute all day long and then close down our economy because they pollute. I mean, that is idiotic. Uh, I'll... Can I be more blunt than that? Uh, yeah, thank you. So uh, I, I, I think- Well on, articulated, sir. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Um, I, I think we need to, we can need to continue to make the point and continue to push for that, to not be held accountable for pollution that we did not produce. And the, you know, the counter side of that is uh, hold us accountable for the pollution that we do produce. Just don't hold us accountable for what, what wasn't from us. And I think we need to uh, continue to kind of uh, try to make that point and see if there's a way to uh, push forward with that. Um, with that particular point in mind, I'll just uh, mention to the members, uh, to my utter amazement, the governor has appointed me to the Colorado Board of Health and uh, they have influence on CDPHE. So we will have a local representation from down here on that board, and we haven't had that for some time. So that could be a potentially an inflection point for further discussions on that, on that as well. So just make that announcement to, to all of you. All right, any other comments or questions on that particular point? All right, hearing none, let's go on to uh, item 6C, the Regional Traffic Crashes web map. Uh, hello. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Let me go ahead and share my screen. And this is Will Mast. He's our uh, lead modeling and GIS person. Just going to do a brief update on uh, something we're releasing, I think, to the public and do a 
going to do a press release around. So just wanted to give the board a, a quick heads up about it. Yes. Uh, is my screen sharing okay? Can everybody see? Yes. All right. You guys should be looking at a web map. Um, yeah, it's an information item. We just wanted to keep the board apprised that this is a public map um, of crash data that has been uh, compiled and geocoded from the years 2015 to 2019. It covers all three counties of the PPACG region. Um, again, it's open to the public. Um, it's available for anybody to look at. There's no login required. Um, it's also publicly and freely available for any of our member governments who have a GIS that would like to uh, own this data. They can download it or simply consume it within their GIS. There's no restrictions on it. The data was compiled as part of a grant. Uh, our transportation planner, Jason O'Brien, I believe discussed this with the board a few months ago, but we got a, uh, he successfully lobbied and got a grant to pull crash data records for our three county region and get them geocoded according to CDOT standards. Once that was completed, GIS staff at PPACG, we have um, cleaned up some of those records a little bit more, made it a little easier to read and understand for the public, and then put it out again on this uh, public application so that anybody can kind of explore the data. What we're looking at right now is just the default symbology based on crash severity. Uh, fatal crashes are in red. Property damage only are very uh, kind of in the background. Um, it's interactive, so anybody can visit the site and zoom in uh, and see some, some trends just from looking at the data. For example, out in Park County, we don't have a lot of crashes, um, but you can look at Highway uh, 285 and see a number of red dots, which means we have a number of fatal crashes. Um, interesting when you consider you know, the traffic flow and the, and the general number of crashes out there. Again, there's not a lot, but the prevalence of fatal and serious injury crashes is pretty high. Uh, we can also change the symbology um, so that if you wanted to see just a heat map, um, that'll come up and you can see it's basically a density of all crashes. So looking in the Colorado Springs area, uh, Academy Boulevard really stands out. Um, you can see a lot of hot spots up and down Academy. And then um, the major interchanges that we have along I-25, so South Academy, um, looking at the Nevada Tejon I-25 area definitely has a, a big heat bloom. Uh, Cimarron and I-25, again, a big heat bloom. And as you zoom in, those densities change so you can further refine and pinpoint what you're looking at for crashes. We also have it clustered, again, to kind of make it a little easier to determine, you know, the raw number of crashes within a given cluster. So if we look in, um, say, at the Cimarron I-25 uh, interchange, we can see that we have um, a cluster of about 210 uh, going on northbound and another cluster of 189 crashes going southbound. Um, going up Cimarron, when we look at the 8th Street and Highway 24 Cimarron inter uh, intersection, 214 crashes there. Specific crashes can be pulled. Um, so if you wanted information about any of these, you can simply click on them uh, and it'll come up with all the summary that was included in the CDOT data. So we can see this was a fatal crash that occurred uh, on Cimarron. Uh, it was a pedestrian. Uh, it was not at the intersection. It was just on Cimarron. And it gives you all the information that was part of the police report that was compiled um, with that data. We also have a couple of charts if people wanted to explore some trends. Um, on the map, we uh, can come over and click the chart button instead of the layer button. And we can look at crash severity by month. And that'll pull up a chart um, and look at all of our data and then just map it out as a chart on the fly. So as we add more crashes, as we continue to work um, on this data, when CDOT releases, for example, the 2020 year crash data, um, this stuff will just be automatically updated once that data uh, gets added to the map, the charts and everything else will update automatically. Uh, an interesting trend uh, when we look at it by month is that uh, every March, um, the number of, uh, um, property damage only crashes uh, drops. You can see these, there's a recurring trend every March, but we don't see that in the serious injury or fatal crashes uh, on a month by month basis. And what we think we're looking at here is actually the impacts of cold reporting uh, in the region. 
since March tends to be the snowiest month and it tends to be when we have the most cold reporting. So if there's no serious injuries, they don't get reported and we kind of see that in the data. Um, so I just found that to be kind of interesting. But we can also chart it uh, total crashes by severity. Again, going back to 2015, we can see that thankfully the number of fatal crashes, uh, 337 in our three county region is fairly low. Property damage only crashes being very, very high, about 45,000 of the 65,000 total crashes being property damage only. Um, so again, this information um, is uh, public. It's available for anybody to explore. Uh, does the board have any questions for me? Uh, yeah, so we may have some, but I'll just uh, make the point in the chat uh, from Gordon Rick, uh, so you're aware of it. Uh, Gordon recommends, could you post the URL for this website? Um, he was looking for it on uh, Google and uh, did not get a match. So I guess we just have a request to post the URL so people can see it. And I think I saw one hand raised at least, uh, uh, Mr. Charles. Yeah, I, you know, this to me is one of those really, really neat tools to have. <clears throat> especially when you look at Park County. Um, that, that little area is between Como and Fairplay. Um, and it had several fatal crashes, which is one of the things we're always arguing about or having that issue with CDOT saying, you know, you gotta get out and start fixing some of these because uh, where we don't have a lot of crashes when people go 65, 75, 85, 100 miles an hour, um, they have a tendency to be a lot more serious crash. But uh, looking at this, because um, uh, I took the link off of our, our packet, it is absolutely amazing the data that is available. And I, I really appreciate the work that went into this because I think it's going to be very, very helpful in several conversations that I have. Thank you. I appreciate uh, your mentioning that the link is in the PPACG packet. Uh, so if you can pull it up electronically, you should be able to click on it and then pull the map up. Are there other questions? I've got just one quick comment, but I'll reserve that. All right. Um, I guess it would be uh, really awesome, and maybe this has already been done, but to make sure uh, this thing is uh, passed to the member um, Department of Transportation offices and just make sure that they know about it or or have it. You've got those contacts already. So maybe it could just be kind of sent in mass via email to everybody that that we have a point of contact with uh, so that uh, we give all of our members an opportunity to have access to it. They, and they may already be using it. I just don't know. But let's just make sure that they they know it's there. OK, great. And for whatever it's worth, that's cool. So. Yeah, that is really cool. Mr. Thank you. Appreciate that, Mr. Chair. We Mr. will definitely uh, make certain that all of our member governments and their planning uh, personnel are aware of this. Um, I'd like to also add, if you are having trouble finding this through a Google search, um, it is located on our main webpage where we have all of our regional GIS and planning data. That's simply ppacg.maps.arcgis.com. Uh, Again, ppacg.maps.arcgis.com. You can explore some of the other web apps uh, and mapping applications that we have developed, including population changes from the census, um, new housing development, and those apps, again, extend over all three counties. And if there's Excellent. any ever, any questions on this, of course, please feel free to reach out. Thank you guys for your time. Well, that just makes it more cool. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Oh, uh, yes, Mr. Zulaga. I just have uh, one comment. I see we have CDOT uh, still with us. And I just got back from a, um, a road trip through a various number of states, but I was coming back into Colorado and, uh, and I can't tell you what highway I was on. I was not paying attention to that. But what I really loved out in the rural area was there'd be the yellow no passing sign. And then when it was safe to pass, there was a sign that said uh, pass with care. And that was consistent on this highway. And I'll tell you, as you're driving along, it became a rhythm. You'd go, oh, no passing, great. Oh, safe to do so. Then when you would look till at that point and then make that, that, um, that pass. And as I was talking to Mayor Pro Tem, um, Gardine, is that what I said? Gardine, uh, he's saying that the, the fatalities out in his area, that can be solved by CDOT, by that forward planning as you look at these stretches of road where the fatalities are. So I just put it out there as for input as a driver recently on the roads. I found that to be a really helpful, uh, continuous, consistent um, signage that was very helpful. 
Great, thank you. Uh, yes, go ahead. Um, uh, Please. Mayor Pro Tem, Roland Gardein, okay. Uh, this would really reinforce men that, uh, the, what we have on the highway right now and the no passing and the passing part because of rolling hills out there, okay. And if we have two visual aids, okay, maybe people might pay attention more. But, but El Paso County uh, Sheriff Department placed at the uh, Elcott intersection there a speed uh, indicator telling you how fast you're, you're going to slow down or you know, you're doing a good job and that kind of stuff. And I visually saw a lot of people slow down. So I, I think there's a lot of good things that happen out there like that. But his, his idea about the, the more sign got there, a really good idea. Great, thank you. Um, Mr. Elsner. Yeah, I wanna pile on on that idea because when you get up into the mountains, uh, there's a lot of times where there's snow on the highway and you don't know that it's a no passing unless you're familiar with the road. And I have some, some people look and say, hey, it's, it's clear because, and go to pass and then discover there was a dip that had a car in it. So, uh, you know, I really like that idea. Um, the biggest problem I see with the signs that give you the speed is I had one of my residents say, well, that is my way of seeing if I can hit 65 before I hit that corner, <laughs> not, oh, gee, the speed limit's 30. <laughs> I wish we could, uh, you know, <laughs> control people's thinking about that a little bit better, but, you know, they have their own, they have their own way of thinking about it. But actually to the point, so there were several folks here that mentioned um, basically signage that is on the side of the road as opposed to the center line with uh, dashes and solid yellow. I'll make the point sometimes at night, sometimes in the rain, sometimes with snow, it is hard to see what's on the road itself. So that is um, uh, sometimes a challenge. So I think we have kind of a, a couple of comments here. Maybe we could ask uh, CDOT, it uh, doesn't necessarily have to be at this meeting, but maybe as a follow on, uh, to let us know if that is kind of a normal policy to put those signs up or, you know, um, if it's maybe a project that's under implementation and some roads are completed. But since we've had a few um, members of the board bring that up, maybe we could ask CDOT to kind of uh, comment to that maybe at our next meeting. So oh. that'd be great. All right. Okay, my, this is John Halls. Can I just ask you to, to make sure I've been typing notes on this, but the, the specific signing you were just talking about again was that no passing passing or? Go ahead. Uh, thanks, John. Yeah, the first one is the yellow one that has the arrow that says uh, no passing. And then the follow up when it was safe to pass was a sign that said um, pass with care. Yeah, yes. The, yeah. And those are where we didn't, we didn't flip and uh, add another set of signs in there. That's it. I just want to make sure I get the right notes to pass on so you can have this conversation with Shane and stuff in the future. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. All right, let's uh, move on then. Oh, actually, are there, is there any other comments with regard to 6C? All right, hearing none, let's move on to reports, military installation reports, and who do we have online here? I didn't see anybody off the top of my head previously. Hey, good morning, this is uh, Chuck Arnold from the Peterson Schreiber Garrison. I've got a quick update if that's okay. Yes, please proceed. Yeah, just, just a couple uh, really quick updates. Some I've, I've covered in the past in this forum. Uh, previously briefed that we would uh, close the golf course here uh, out at uh, Peterson Space Force Base on 1 January. That has happened. Uh, the golf course is closed. Uh, we've been able to place all employees but one, and we're, uh, we're still working that, uh, which, which means there's a great opportunity, obviously, to partner with the community. I won't go into too much depth in, in this forum, but uh, a great opportunity to partner with the community leadership on the way forward. Uh, but the golf course is uh, is officially closed. Uh, it's uh, both uh, uh, sad and at the same time, like I said, a great opportunity. A uh, couple other quick items. Uh, Space Force turned two on December 20th for those who weren't tracking. So it feels like uh, um, the, uh, the the National Defense uh, Authorization Act uh, th that uh, implemented it just happened, but it's been two years as the time certainly flies. Uh, one other issue that I wanted to mention, uh, just because it, it gets really confusing with all the changes. So, uh, as most of you know, uh, previously the um, 21st Space Wing at Peterson combined with the 50th Space Wing 
uh, at Trever, uh, as well as uh, some of the elements at Cheyenne Mountain become the Peterson Trever Garrison, um, which is Army term terminology, which confuses a lot of folks in the community. Um, right now, tentatively scheduled for one March, we will go through another name change. Um, so the what is now the Peterson and Schriever Garrison, which provides a support to all the major mission partners at Peterson and Schriever Air Force Base in Cheyenne Mountain, will become Space Base Delta One, uh, which is consistent to the to the naming convention at other Space Force bases. So again, on uh, right around one March, we'll become uh, Space Base Delta One. The only thing that will really change is is names and signs. Uh, that one of the big benefits from this is we still have multiple cultures. We have a Cheyenne Mountain culture, we have a Shriver culture, we have a Peterson culture, uh, and and hopefully this this name change will will better allow us to do the mission, but also get after some of the cultural differences. Uh, I know that was fast and furious, uh, and I guess a final update, just like the local community, um, we are dealing with uh, with COVID challenges uh, and the new variant. Uh, as a result, last week we went to a, a HPCon. Uh, Bravo Plus, uh, which is pretty consistent with a lot of the, uh, uh, the, the guidance from the local community, uh, which means we're doing a little bit more teleworking, uh, less in-person meetings, uh, less large group uh, meetings uh, in, a, in an attempt to, uh, to protect our folks while still accomplishing the mission, but also protect those in the community that we interact with. And that is my quick, fast and furious update, uh, pending any questions. Uh, thank you, Mr. Arnold. Are there any uh, questions? And uh, I appreciate uh, uh, the updates, <clears throat> and I'll just make a, a point, and it's a, a lighthearted point. Um, you know, I uh, understand, you know, that the golf course is now closed. I'm sure that's really valuable real estate for uh, adding mission capability in there because of its proximity to the rest of the building. So I know that there's real value in it. But I just want to mention to my Army brothers and sisters that we now have three Air Force and Space Force bases without a golf course, and Fort Carson still has one. So I'm not I hope I don't get any more jokes coming from the Army about uh, Air Force starts with the golf course and then builds around it because now we have the reverse here in our community. So I just thought I would mention that just for fun. <laughs> thank you. All right, All right. Thank you, sir. Yeah. I don't know if I'm really sensitive about it, but uh, I just, you know, uh, there's always banter going out between the go going on between the services and, you know, you never miss an opportunity. So, yes, right. sir. <laughs> thank you. Uh, do we have anybody else? Uh, did you say that we had? Okay, uh, current, yeah, oh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, Mr. Gardine, please. Yeah, does the Army know how to play golf? Oh, I love you, man. You're great. <laughs> you know, my favorite part of that, just very briefly, is uh, the banter just goes on and on and on, and it's always intense. And those that don't know about the banter sometimes look at these folks, oh, my God, they hate each other. No, we actually do it out of love. <laughs> we just give each other a really hard time. So thank you for contributing to that. And I think we did have somebody from uh, the Air Force Academy. Did I understand that? We have a colonel from the Air Force Academy online. Yeah, good, good morning, sir. This is uh, Colonel Jimmy John. I, uh, I apologize. I'm actually primarily taking notes. Uh, Air Base Wing leadership were, were not able to attend today. So I don't have a, a lot of talking points. Uh, I will say that our golf co courses are still open. Um, <laughs> Thank so you very much. We're the, last, uh, <laughs> we're the last Air Force base that, have, that has golf courses. Uh, and then I'll mirror... Um, what Peterson said, we are having the same COVID challenges. So um, there may be some services on base that are temporarily limited uh, for those that have access to those services. So that's all I have to report. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, congratulations to Air Force Academy football. And I am so glad that your golf courses remain open. They are pretty awesome up there at the Academy. So any questions for the Colonel at the Air Force Academy at this point? All right, let's uh, continue through the, the military reports. Uh, obviously, 7B through 7F uh, are, uh, we have uh, uh, no presentation uh, for any of these at this time. And we move now to 7G, the CDOT monthly update. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Richard Zamora with CDOT, uh, the Region 2 Transportation Director. I'm going to kick this off at a fairly high level, then I'm going to turn it over to John Hall to give some very specific project updates. but. You know, as part of the agenda day, we've talked about probably two of the biggest activities that CDOT's been working on uh, in recent times. Uh, first being the greenhouse gas rule. Um, the Transportation Commission did adopt a rule at their December meeting. 
Um, and so, you know, that room, rule is going to be in effect and we're going to have to do analysis on all of our planning efforts going forward about, you know, the impacts on greenhouse gases. So it's my understanding, I think there was a workshop that PPACG has already held uh, to go over the rule and what some of the, the impacts may be. There's still a lot more work to be done too about on, on the implementation side from a policy perspective as well. So, um, but we are making progress going forward on that. Um, similarly, the other topic we spent a bunch of time talking about is updating our 10 year plan. Um, in general, right now, as I said, we're still working through, you know, what uh, Senate Bill 260 uh, contains for CDOT, as well as, um, you know, what the Infrastructure and in Investment Jobs Act um, also provided to CDOT, um, and, and trying to and analyze that and determine, you know, how much revenue do we actually realistically project to be coming from both of those. And so as soon as I have that, you know, I'll have control totals that I'll be able to work with PPACG on in terms of actually doing formal project selection and, and be able to work towards a budget. Uh, for the plan update. Currently, the schedule is to try to get that plan updated, you know, and have it adopted by commission sometime late spring this year. Um, the final thing I'll mention is, um, you know, we do one of our first four year projects in the initial plan, uh, State Highway 115 is, is making is moving forward. Uh, we did have a, an open house uh, last week for that particular project. We had good attendance. We got a lot of good feedback from folks. Um, I think it's going to be a really good project for us, and we'll hopefully have it advertised and out on the street later on this spring. So with that, I'll turn it over to John Hall. And if you if you might uh, indulge me for a second before uh, Mr. Hall starts, I uh, just want to express my appreciation for that work you're doing on 115. I know the residents deeply appreciate it. I did go to the open house as well as several others from uh, PPACG and uh, looking forward to the start of that project. And we know that there's a lot of danger on that road with high speed, heavily loaded trucks intermingling with local residents getting uh, on and off 115. And some key parts of that project is acceleration and deceleration lanes so the residents can get in and out and a section of the road that will be widened and a really an outdated and obsolete bridge that's way too narrow uh, reconstructing that. So appreciate CDOT, uh, CDOT's work uh, in that effort, along with all the other great projects that are going on down here. So thank you. So Mr. Hall. Yes, thank you. So um, the first one I'd like to just chat about is the MAMSIP projects overall. And it looks like they're, um, they're really making, there's gonna be a lot of movement on across the board on all the MAMSIP projects. Um, you got 94 Blarney, um, intersection improvements out there uh, starting here in about in April, May, excuse me, in March, April. Um, utility work has already been ongoing on that. You've got um, South Academy um, and I, or the bridges over South Academy on I-25. Uh, they should be looking, we should be looking at restriping that imminently here um, and, and starting with the bridge removal work on that. South Academy widening also looking to construct to begin construction in March uh, 2022, so March of this year. Uh, Charter Oak Ranch as well. They're they're placing the original the initial erosion control and the overall I-25 rehab. Um, they're south of the Academy Boulevard, you know, down um, stretching towards Fountain. Uh, they're in the process of doing some restriping on that and getting ready to place concrete barriers. So. That project is kicking really fully into gear over the next uh, few months at, at many at, multi, at all the locations. All right, powers and research is um, the biggest thing. Are you going to change? Everybody's going to see. Obviously, they're working on the bridges and and uh, abutments, all that. And the biggest thing you're going to see is it looks like the west side approach there on research will open up as a right in right out so that traffic will be able to access powers boulevard again so um, there still won't be the through movement across powers you'll have to use the um, turnarounds to the north and south but um, we're getting getting a, getting some more mobility and making good progress on that project uh, i'm also we have uh, an overlay resurfacing of us 24 to be to woodland park should be kicking off all night work um, here as the spring warms up. And you guys are ready to just discuss the 115 project. Um, let me just make sure, yeah, 24 FY for those who might be aware, it looks like the there was a curve correction there at 24 at Florissant and that got, um, we had two high bids and we weren't able to award that project. Uh, but Scott's unit is also working 
to advertise um, improvements in fair play, um, intersection improvements uh, in and around US 285 and State Highway 9. So that project is also on track to advertise in the coming uh, couple months. Let me see if I have another project. I think that's it for my update. I would like to add one other thing, and that is just that I did try to do some research over the last half hour. So more on that Woodland Park, north of Woodland Park, US 67, that's on the 10 year plan. And I'm looking back at my notes and talking with Shane. I believe that project is, is really, there's been very little seed out work on it. I believe it's driven by Teller County and or Woodland Park has actually had the initial consultant work on it. There hasn't been any seed out work. So I am not, I was not able to drum up any exact scope on that. Um, but I will make sure to pass on to Shane to make sure the TAC, you know, has has a very as a detailed understanding of the scope in that project, and, and that once it comes to you guys for approval, that that information goes with it. Yeah, but thank you, Mr. Hall. Um, there was a comment from a Region Two representative, and I'm forgetting the lady's name. Wendy Pettit. Wendy Pettit. Thank you. Wendy Pettit made made mention of uh, starting of funding for the study in July of 2024, and that was a CDOT rep. So I don't know. Yeah. And now, I, I, now I I'm not sure I, if that was in reference to uh, uh, Teller County funding or CDOT funding, but nonetheless, well, that point was made. I'm, I'm, I'm now that I'm pretty confident that is there's F, two million dollars of RPP 2024 slotted for us to to kick into that project. I just don't. I, I haven't. I, I asked Scott Schnacki, the other resident engineer. I don't think the exact scope is actually. Neither he nor I are aware of the exact scope that we would be pursuing on that. You know, other than. Don. The more that's general a, that's a partner project with the yep. city of Woodland Park now. Um, it's kind of had some evolving changes made in the last iteration of the of the tip and whatnot. So it's it's a partner project, and there's five hundred thousand dollars of our funding to start with, and then the um, city of Woodland Park is going to match the funding, and and we've given them enough time to be able to save the funding they need to to match our federal funding so that we can move forward. Yeah, bottom line is I'm, I apologize. I, I, I have not been able to dig up the exact scope, but I'll, I'll make sure to pass it on to Shane. To, yeah, no, to no worries, John. We appreciate you bringing it up again. And I, um, I know Mr. Stone has a comment, but I also know Mr. Zulaga. Did you still have a comment? Or are you good? OK, uh, Mr. Stone and then uh, the mayor. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, yeah, John, this is Eric Stone, Teller County. Um, just for clarification, because uh, it kind of breezed past before I got the, the details fully uh, figured out in my brain that uh, the improvement on, you said it was a uh, curve straightening, US 24 at Florissant. Uh, you said the bids were high on that, so it wasn't awarded. Is that was that That's what correct. you were saying? That's correct. And next step on that would be rebid? Yeah, I, I I don't know exactly when we would we would do that. I I'm I'm not sure if they're going to try to do that before. Um, we will re-advertise, but the timing is not certain. Is the is the bottom line of the update I have right now? We're still working on that timing. Thank you. Being up in the mountains, I think it might be hard to get in and get a more cost-effective bid this year. Or so for for this summer's construction, I think that's the thing about you. I would imagine that would be a challenge uh, everywhere because there's an enormous amount of construction going on everywhere. So that could be tough. All right, uh, Mayor. Thank you. Um, on the Charter Oak Ranch Road project, I noticed they took the temporary um, uh, changes of the uh, 20, down to 25 miles an hour to permanent signs, which is great because they're not gonna blow out in the road <laughs> next time we have the, those 100 mile an hour winds. But we do not have a sign yet that says business is open. And that was a request from the businesses 10, 15 years ago when this project was discussed that we have a sign on the road that businesses are open during construction. Um, since they are putting that roundabout right in the intersection where you turn, it's gonna get kind of confusing. So we wanna make sure that uh, that, that is, that's up there. So thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Elsner. Yes, um, it, when we start talking Park County, I appreciate the 9285 interchange that is going to be, uh, I think, a huge improvement after the next two years and it's done. Um, but we do have uh, the bridge that's south of Fair Play. Um, I, I don't need an answer today, but if you could get an idea of um, when they're going to start that one up again, 
Uh, they stopped the project last year because of the fires and the mess that they were having on I-70 and 285 was one of those roads people were using. And then I believe there were a couple of other bridges that uh, were on the, the radar. And I can't remember if it was this year or next year. Um, so if you could get an update on some of those bridge projects, uh, that'd be great. Thank you. Yeah, and, and I can, I can, I don't know about the, the second part of your question about a bunch of other future bridges. I'd have to, I'd have to check in. I'd have to pass that on to Shane to see if can get you that information. But I do have, I'm glad, I appreciate you mentioning, I do have a note here that that bridge on 285 at Park County there um, is going to continue construction, kick back off in the spring here. Great, glad to hear that. Um, I'm, I'm sure Mr. Elsner appreciates that. So, okay. Any other comments or questions with regard to our CDOT monthly update? Sir. Yes, sir. So uh, John and Wendy, this is Robert with Woodland Park. Uh, I just wanted to clarify, just to connect the dots and it doesn't have to happen now because of course this is just your report time. But I heard John, you say there's $2 million set aside for it. Wendy, I heard you say there's a $500,000 match with the city. Who do I talk to to make sure all the dots are connected there so that we can all be on the same page? So it was Sally Riley. <laughs> so She's not, retired I now. <laughs> I know, and I can't remember the, the lady's um, name that's her replacement, so forgive me. Um, so mm -hmm. we have um, we have a process in place, and, and it, it really is a Shane um, question for the for the details. So let us get to Shane, and that way we can get back with you with some definite accurate information and that way we're all on the same page and moving forward correctly okay perhaps you could just include me in the email chain uh with the new uh planning director so we can sure uh, sure okay. absolutely all right thank you no problem and john is there anything else that we need to do with you with your with where your earmark funds are no, the funding that's on the on the list and in that that first column, if you will, about funding on, on the previous spreadsheet was shown. I believe those are, are relatively in place, to my understanding. They're, and then engineering are wise, planned. good. That, that's correct. They are. They're in the tip. Thanks, sir. Great. Um, any other questions or comments regarding the CDOT monthly update? Great. Hearing none, uh, just my express my appreciation to CDOT. Great uh, update, great questions, great answers. and. That's the kind of communication that always makes things uh, easier and better for all of us. So thank you. Let's move on to the stack update. Okay, Holly Williams, stack representative. Um, I, I will state that in um, December, we didn't have a meeting. The Transportation Commission did publish the greenhouse gas regulations that they approved. And um, I have the document sitting by my bed as nice bedside reading. But if you want the PowerPoint presentation, you can come on Friday to our meeting at 9 a.m. Um, where we will do uh, some current events. We'll talk about some legislative issues and the Transportation Commission report up front. And then um, we'll have some of some people's favorite TPR representative updates, which frequently takes more than 20 minutes because uh, you get some really uh, fun stories there. And so we've tried to cut that down a little bit. And uh, we're also going to discuss the 10 year plan and the money um, to fund the 10 year plan. Uh, we'll talk about a PowerPoint with the um, greenhouse gas planning rule overview so that we can all better understand um, how our lives are going to change. And um, that would be it. So uh, starts at nine, usually goes till it, it says it's going to end at 1130. I would suspect you should count on 12. So and you uh, have yes. to bring your own donuts. <laughs> bring your own donuts and Mr. Stone. <laughs> just, just a quick question, Commissioner Williams, is that night bedtime reading, is that when you wake up in the middle of the night, can't get back to sleep? Because I couldn't imagine reading that and then not being able to actually go to sleep after reading it. If, if I had an insomnia, I would make it about three lines in. So I imagine it's real exciting. <laughs> but for, for your information, I do think John Leosados has poured through the front of the back already. So 
Great, thank you. <laughs> All right. Uh, I, anything else on the stack report? All I right. just I just wanted to thank uh, Commissioner Williams for reminding me why I couldn't remember what happened at the December meeting. Yeah, we didn't have one. <laughs> <laughs> It's always good to be refreshed after the Christmas holidays and find out what meetings didn't exist that you didn't go to. <laughs> All right, thank you. Uh, let's go ahead now to the executive director's report. Uh, very up. briefly, uh, a couple of items uh, while Jessica gets ready to give a quick legislative uh, update. I'm going to follow up with an email to the board on a couple of different organizational things. We want to make sure you've got the meeting schedule for 2022 for our board meetings and our workshops. We've got to make a couple of adjustments because of some stack conflicts with a couple of Friday mornings on our workshop dates. We want to make sure we've got the right um, representatives from each one of your jurisdictions and your alternates. We can get that all square. Sometimes that takes some cleaning up. Uh, so we'll get that out to you as well. Um, and also a board uh, brief handbook, um, director's handbook that we talked about at the retreat last month. It's got a lot of great background information on you um, for you and, and some other stuff that's a follow up from the retreat that we had uh, from last month. So I'll get that out in a separate email um, later on today, hopefully. But a couple of legislative items that Jessica wanted to brief on as well. So go for it, Jessica. Just a super quick thing, uh, mainly three things. One, beginning next month, you'll be getting a legislative update every board meeting. Um, the legislative session begins today, which is why um, you'll be getting those. And I just wanted to give everyone a process reminder for how the legislative committee and PPACG's legislative positions work. Um, our lobbyist and I review all of the bills, restrict them down to the ones that we think might be PPACG, the legislative committee, pins those down even more, gets rid of everything that doesn't relate to our legislative themes, reviews those bills and proposes a position, oppose, support, amend, monitor, or just toss. Um, those positions are then emailed to the board of directors. You then have 24 hours to respond to me with your feedback or information on that. If I don't hear anything back that is in opposition to the positions of the legislative committee, that is the adopted position of PPACG. And those are sent to Dan, our lobbyist. To, that's what we tell our legislators. Um, so you'll get those emails from me on Mondays after the legislative committee reviews those bills. If there are any objections, that bill will be brought to the PPACG board of directors for discussion before we give a position to our legislators. For PPACG, for those issues, it does require a two third vote to approve those positions. Um, it is not just a majority, it does require that two thirds of the board um, that are present to vote that day must approve the position being recommended. Um, and those are the things I wanted to highlight. I think I covered everything and the committee is recommending um, Dick Elsner and Sharon Thompson as our co-chairs for 2022, um, which is something that is confirmed slash appointed only directly by the board chair, so. Great, thank you very much. Stuff. Appreciate the quick update. Are there any comments or questions with regard to those procedures? Uh, yes, Mayor. Yeah, I would just like to note that if we do ever have a time, which we have had where the two thirds vote comes into play, please, if you're whichever side of that vote you're on, take a minute, jot your um, reasons for your vote in opposition or support of something um, and get them to Jessica quick because our representatives do want to hear both sides of those positions. Um, so um, it's very, very important to them. Yes, Mr. Donaldson. Uh, one question for Jessica. You mentioned if there are any objections, um, do you mean an objection from an individual board member regarding the position PPAC is just is going to take? Is, is that what you meant? Yes. Okay. So you'll get that proposed position. And if you've got an objection to the proposed position, you'll respond back to me. And then we'll we'll have a vote on that. Is that correct? Yeah. If we yeah. if we see that we have objection, um, you know, there's there's good and there's bad about that. The object, objection gets noted, and that's good because then you know, we continue the proper dynamics of the board, but it does mean we'll take a little extra time to figure out what the position needs to be on that particular uh, piece of proposed legislation. And there will be some time needed to get us to that. Mm -hmm. But um, the other flip side of that is if there's no objection made, um, it means that we can proceed post haste and, and get that to our lobbyist. And, 
you know, as, as the legislative session gets towards the end, this will be moving fast. Uh, there'll, there'll be a lot of dynamics going on. So it behooves all of the board members to pay attention to those emails from Jessica and get your responses back as quickly as possible. It's within 24 hours, right? Within that's, 24 that's hours. Yeah. It is. And, and the emails I send out will say that. Okay. Um, they'll also include links to things like our bill tracking information. So if you want updates, you'll hear from me during the legislative session. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions with regard to, uh, well, actually, do you have any more, Andy, any more updates, Andy? Okay, great. Any other questions with regard to the legislative update? I appreciate getting that. And seeing none, uh, it's now time for member entity announcements. Uh, we'll go around the table. Does anybody have an announcement they wish to make at this point? And our meetings run a little long here, but it's been a good meeting, I think. We've had a lot of good discussion. So go around the table. All right, anybody online? All right, hearing none, recall our next meeting, second Wednesday in February, 9 February 22. Look forward to seeing you all there. Uh, this meeting is adjourned, and thank you very much for the great participation we had. It was an excellent meeting. Thank you all, and you have a great afternoon.